Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you please settle down quickly? We don't have uh, all morning for this session. We have uh, quite a lot to do. And uh, <laughs> welcome to the seventh meeting of 2016 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Remind members uh, that, that we move, before we move to the first item on the agenda, that uh, all mobile phones should be switched off, at least because they can affect the broadcast system. However, committee members and others may use tablets during the meeting because the uh, meeting papers are in digital form. So the first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence from stakeholders as part of the committee's process of compiling its legacy report. We are glad to be joined by two panels of witnesses this morning, all of whom were asked to submit a list of priority areas for consideration by successor committees. I might say we've marked these out of 10, and those who don't know what a bullet point is are going to get 100 lines. Uh, so this meeting will, will be conducted on the basis of having bullet points, answers, not treatise. Uh, we thank you all for sending these. We've read them with interest at great length in some cases and identified common themes for each panel which will form the structure of our questions today. And uh, I will not uh, ask everyone to introduce themselves because many of you are known to each other and known to us uh, for many years. Uh, but welcome here anyway. And, um, when you wish to speak, just catch my eye or the clerk's eye, and we will make a list of those who wish to contribute. I'd like to kick off with uh, the theme about, um, in this case, about rural development economies and communities, um, because this is the Rural Affairs Committee, um, including broadband rural democracy and decision-making. I was interested to see comments from SLE about uh, beefing up community councils. It's interesting to see development trusts talking about the need to have uh, good examples out there. Uh, but, you know, I think there's wider issues about rural democracy that need to be looked at. And I'd like to uh, open uh, this just now, bearing in mind this is a legacy paper where we're trying to use the experience we've had to put forward ideas for the future and not to go over all of the activities that have happened in the past, but to learn from them. So is there anyone who would like to uh, kick off with that? Because I just think that that's at the heart of uh, decision taking and decision making. Anybody like to comment? Sarah Jane, you mentioned the SLE were interested in beefing up community councils. Why? So we should look at the operation of rural community councils. I don't think we made any recommendations about um, beefing them up. Um, I do think that during discussions on the Community Empowerment Bill, there were, dis um, there were concerns raised about deficit in local decision making. And I think that if we want to deliver some of the rural development policy and indeed the objectives of, of land reform, we do have to address some of these so that the discussions we're having about sustainable development, community engagement, don't take place in a vacuum. That um, certainly all local areas, localities, communities are aware of what they're trying to, uh, trying to deliver. Thank you for that. Yes, Sarah Skerritt. Morning. Okay, it's automatic today. Yeah. Um, I would like the committee to maintain an awareness that the next committee about unintended consequences of the very good um, legislation and other elements being put in place for uh, devolution and local democratic initiatives. Um, we have the Rural Parliament, for example, um, the Scotland Bill, Community Empowerment, Scotland Act. Um, there's also uh, much activity around community energy and community benefit funds, community broadband. Um, these are all extremely welcome. I think at the same time there's a need to be aware of inequities that will arise and already arise um, from these initiatives because there are assumptions that all communities are equally um, able to seize these opportunities, which we know from evidence is not the case. And so if there is increasing reliance on such initiatives to address systemic issues, um, then we're going to have... Um, some areas doing well, some areas falling behind, and growing inequity within rural. 
So that's something I feel um, must maintain a profile. Graham D, and then Mike Russell want to chip in just now. Uh, Sarah Skerritt makes a very good point, but I would ask her, how would you go about building the capacity to ensure that you didn't get into that situation? There are many initiatives, and we have DTAS here today and other agencies who are doing a great job in that regard. My point would be that we need to have coherence around that. So rather than having pockets of really <coughs> successful activity, which is often dependent on um, local champions, we need to have something systemic that monitors where this isn't happening, where this is happening, learning from good practice circulating that. Much of that is happening, but at the same time today, there are communities still uh, not able to take advantage of these opportunities. So um, it's that systemic, coherent approach, uh, strategic approach that's needed rather than a reliance on um, sporadic uh, work at ground level, which is very welcome. Mike Russell. Getting to grips with the problem of depopulation in rural Scotland uh, strikes me as one of the key issues that we need to address going forward. This committee, perhaps in the successor committee, needs to address and in that regard, investment in basic infrastructure and an understanding of what basic infrastructure is seems to me to be vital. Um, our Guile and Butte Council have just published a report by a, a task force set up, chaired by Nick Ferguson of B-Sky-B, which draws attention to uh, connectivity, digital and physical connectivity, as being the two key investments that will be required to be made to stem depopulation. It would be interesting to know the reflections of people on the panel about that. Perhaps Sarah, who has some expertise in dealing with that, would be a useful starter in that. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think, without wishing to repeat myself too much, I think it's this need to have a strategic oversight and a coherence. So there are initiatives, some born out of necessity, to do with broadband coverage, where communities have had to seize um, their own opportunities and create their own opportunities. And we know of some very innovative and good examples, indeed, in your area. Um, However, we need to map that against um, national strategic initiatives and make sure that there aren't these hot spots and not spots. Um, I was reading a paper the other day about the new arguments in information society, and it's not whether or not you've got broadband, it's what type of broadband you've got and how functional it is. So, um, and that's harder for those without to argue about. It used to be 15 years ago you could agitate for broadband. Um, those of you who are on dial-up. Now it's much harder to agitate for a quality of connectivity um, and to know who to agitate to because the landscape is quite complex for those who are seeking to step into it. So I think it's about having this overview, um, recognising what's working well and also um, building up the opportunities um, in a systematic way rather than hoping that things will trickle down or trickle across. Mike, you want to come back. Shouldn't we take a, uh, an Occam's razor approach to this? The simplest solution or the most obvious solution is usually the best. Government has a role to say there are some things which are basic services mm -hmm. um, and they, therefore they should be provided. You know, 19th century it was sanitation uh, that was the issue. Yeah. Um, so to say that broadband is a basic service that people should have, and indeed, you know, the UK government has been indicating, and Ofcom has been indicating in the last week, that there is also a minimum standard that should apply to that. Uh, I think we should be much, much simpler about this going forward, and simply say that there is an expectation that the government will uh, ensure that all citizens are provided in this way, because there are, you know, across the continent, other governments who are taking that simple point of view. I think for communities to be scrabbling around very often is not the least pr most productive way. It leads to some good initiatives, but it's not the most productive way of providing uh, basic services. And if I may respond, Convener, um, there are uh, examples of countries who have instigated a minimum standard, and there are also um, those commentators who say it is now a human right mm -hmm. to have this type of access. And if, if you can't define it as a human right with capital H and R, it, it enables human rights to be realized. So even yeah. if in a second step, it's a human right. So I think it is incumbent on uh, the new uh, committee to be looking at this in all seriousness because of how it links to social justice as well. Um, and one, one word of caution about um, having a minimum standard, I know when Norway introduced its um, rights for all, as, you know, broadband as a, a human right, it went to more on one megabit per second as, as the basic. Yeah. So there is a danger of lowering it to 
um, the lowest common denominator, if you like. Um, nonetheless, there, there, there are arguments, very strong, compelling arguments at European level and European, Europe 2020 about how if we don't do this, irrespective of location, then um, we're going to have greater divergence within regions, let alone between regions. Yeah. Um, I've got Dave Thompson, Bertie Armstrong and Ian Cook who wanted to come in. Uh, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to do it that way, OK? Right, Dave? Yeah, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to everyone on the, on the panel. Uh, I find this quite fascinating, and uh, as a Rural Affairs Committee, I, th I think there's, a, uh, there's no doubt, and when Sarah was outlining the number of different community initiatives, there's a huge range, and there is a real danger that there isn't um, a, a sort of strategic approach to it, but you can have regional you can have national strategic, you can have regional strategic, but what we're talking about here is local strategic coordination mm -hmm. um, and, and a body that can help the local community to focus and to try to pull things together. And, and that sort of brings me back to the sort of community council point <coughs> that was um, raised by SLE, but maybe not in relation to community councils. And I'd like some comment on this. I get the feel going around my constituency in the Highlands that people are very, very keen to have a really local uh, council type body with real power, with finance raising power and with real beef, doing much more than the old small district councils that we had in Highland and with populations ranging from maybe 5,000 to 20,000 where these small councils would really be able to help to coordinate all these excellent community initiatives. And I wonder if Sarah can maybe comment on a model like that. Yeah. And uh, we will need to think about moving on in a minute or two because this is a good start, but, uh, uh, but, but very fair points that Dave has made. So Sarah and then uh, Bertie and then Ian on this subject. I'll, right. I'll keep it brief, convener. Thank you, uh, uh, Dave. The OECD produced a report in 2008 on rural policy and one of their um, headline points was the number of organisations operating within and for rural Scotland and they said there were over 100 um, organisations that were focused on rural community development and that was, um, what's that, eight years ago now and I'm sure the landscape is similarly cluttered. Um, and so the, the difficulties of navigating at local level are, are a real challenge. And that links to your point of having local, um, local bodies, but with power. And the, the challenge of having power is linked to this difficulty of navigating the landscape and where do you hook in, who do you talk to, who do you relate to. So I think that, again, there's a need for mapping, for being strategic, and having multi-level, because it's not either or. It's not the top down and bottom up. They're working together in a vertically integrated way. But that doesn't happen on its own. So there's, there's a deal of work to be done there. And it would be great if the successor committee could be mindful of these really critical issues. Uh, Bertie Armstrong and Ian Cook. Very short. Th Good morning, Camina. Thank you very much indeed. Um, to move away slightly from the... Uh, really important and interesting area of local democracy and what can be done to enable it um, to the functions of the RACI, um, particularly the next RACI. Um, I would make a plea, and it's the one bullet point, although there was no dot there, uh, um, it, it, and that is evidence and waiting when you are going about your business. This committee is going about its business of scrutiny. Um, it, it, you will get in the evidence a great deal of evidence and opinion, and it will be very important in my view and there is an example this term, very important in my view, that the, the, the committee takes great care to dispassionately look at evidence levels and weighting. Otherwise, you will have the unintended consequences that, uh, that Dr. Sarah referred to um, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the hopeless consequence that Mike Russell referred to of, uh, of accelerating the process of depopulation if the unintended consequence is the cessation of, uh, of sustainable activity. We'll leave that on the table and bear it in mind. Thank you for the stricture that you've given us. Um, whether we respond to that as members or in this uh, round table is another matter. Ian Cook. Yeah, I think um, from our experience of going around the country, many rural communities would say that local government doesn't feel that local. And to some extent, I, I think that the sort of activity that we're involved in, development trust, the sort of community anchor type organisations you were talking about, Dave, operate within that vacuum. 
There's a space there that, 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 that they've filled. And a lot of that activity has been largely organic and it's been largely bottom up. And I think the challenge for government is if you want to see more of that, how do you do that? There's no blueprint and I think that's the danger. The, the danger is, that, or the, the challenge is, how do you uh, encourage, inspire, support that development but, it's, but it looks different in different communities without really suppressing the real qualities of creativity, enterprise that communities are showing, which is the essence and, and, and contributes to the success of that. So the real challenge there, and I would draw the committee's attention to a report by Nesta called Mass Localism, where they, where they kind of try to address that particular question about how does government support that kind of local development without doing it in a uniform way and killing the very essence of what makes it successful. Alec Ferguson. <clears throat> point when we're talking about community development convener if I may um, which is to point to what I see as a growing inequality between communities particularly in, in the area I represent but I'm sure it exists in others as well which is brought about by the advent of wind farm community benefit funds because we are I, I believe reaching a situation where we have some very wealthy rural communities because they have access to funding and some who are uh, at the opposite end of the scale in terms of available funding and I think that is and will become a greater part of community development as we go forward and it might well be something that a successor committee want, might want to look at one or two councils have looked at sort of siphoning off 50 percent to, to deliver but it, it's failed certainly in, in my, my region's case and I just think it, it is a growing issue when it comes to community development. There's a way of looking at this which could suggest that some communities actually have more power to try and augment uh, the funds which are available from councils in their area and indeed invest in other areas um, with that uh, community benefit. But uh, we could talk about that all day, I suspect. Um, I, agree, I agree that uh, the imbalance is there, but in some of the poorest communities that I have in my constituency, um, we can see the benefits of people sitting down and making a strategy for how they're going to spend the money that they are due. Getting anything well in, in my part of the world, a lot of communities aren't getting anything at all. Well, that's, that's definitely something for the future community yeah. committee to look at. Uh, Jim Hume, you're going to kick us off on agriculture. Yes, uh, thank you very, very much, convener. Yeah, we'd just uh, like to hear the, the panel's view on agriculture. What, what are some of the challenges, opportunities uh, that face us in the, in the next five years of, of, of this committee? Obviously, CAP, SRDP perhaps science and research, uh, food security and, and the panel members' visions for agriculture. Yes, Patrick Crouch. Thank you. <coughs> we um, submitted five points um, which we suggested are the, the five issues that need to go forward in crofting. And one of those points was um, croft-proofing financial incentives. And the issue we're making about this is that, as we've alluded to in the press quite a lot more lately as well, is that we feel that crofting gets marginalised in agricultural, particularly in the CAP, in the Common Agricultural Policy, and the way Scotland uses the CAP. So um, an issue that we would like the next um, committee please to um, participate in is... In this round of the CAP, we've still got the areas of natural constraint um, to, to deal with and, and to develop a, a formula whereby areas of natural constraint get some sort of compensation for the situation that they stay in. Um, unfortunately, the, cabinet, the current Cabinet Secretary has said publicly that he is minded to keep the ANC as much like LFAS as possible, and we would argue that that is completely against the spirit of what ANC is. LFAS is being used at the moment for paying higher amounts of money to better land, even though it's called the less favoured area support scheme, and we don't want to see ANC going the same way. Good, that's an issue for the future committee. I most certainly agree. Um, anyone? Uh, we've got uh, several people here. Um, so, Dave Thompson, then Claire Slipper. Yeah, just on 
this uh, um, point of, of agriculture, but particularly in relation to crofting. Um, uh, I'm sure Patrick might want to comment on this and maybe others as well. We, we've had a very welcome increase to the Croft House grant scheme uh, just recently announced by the Minister. Uh, and just tying in with the broader issue of improving rural housing, I think the, the next stage to do with the uh, addition of a loan element to that, and I know the Minister is looking at that, but how important do uh, members of the panel feel that is in actually uh, allowing people to access you know, the grants and, and build the houses that we need in the crofting areas? Patrick come back and clear slipper to come in just after that. Thank you. Um, I think it is in, it's essential to, the, to the, um, the mix of grant and loan. We used to have um, a, cross, a cross, croft building um, grant and loan scheme, the CBGLS, and in 2004 the loan element was taken away. And I remember at the time um, there being a sort of puzzlement or there were an apparent puzzlement in government officials as to why crofters were so agitated that the loan was being taken away because there was an assumption that what people want is a grant. This is completely um, against what crofters actually want. In all of our um, local um, consultations, people really want the loan element. That's actually more important than the grant. And, and as I've said in our short paper, the fact that the government has reviewed this scheme at last is, is very welcome. And the fact that the, um, the grant levels have gone up um, reflecting inflation over the years, which is, which is um, good. But the loan element is absolutely essential. And, and so we need this. In fact, this committee, I would remind you, this committee recommended to the, to the Scottish government um, that the loan element needs to be reinstated. So, again, I would ask that this is something that this committee takes into the next, um, the next phase of government and continues to lobby the Scottish Government on having a loan element. Thanks for that. Um, we will take that down and note it. Um, Claire Slipper and uh, some wider agricultural matters, I don't. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, this committee has it, it touched on a really important um, theme uh, when it focused on the dairy inquiry last year um, and there are some really important issues that were brought up in that that we felt were extremely pertinent to what Jim was hinting at in his question with regards to food production and security and how we can really emphasise food sufficiently, sorry, sufficiency in Scotland and the UK. Um, what we would want a successor committee to look at is the medium and longer term issues and um, things that can be implemented in which to secure food production in Scotland. Um, we said in our written evidence it's about kind of developing supply chains, um, export potential, how we can attract further investment and processing into Scotland, um, and also looking more locally about how we can better promote um, local food and procurement. Uh, and these are some really important issues which we would like to see a committee examine um, in the future. Uh, and also just picking up on the points to do with the common agricultural policy, um, it seems a long way off now, but we'll be looking ahead to a, a new reform in 2020. Um, and we feel this offers quite a valuable opportunity to do some pre-legislative um, scrutiny work and um, bringing together all the different voices across the spectrum to try and find some common ground before that negotiation does take place. And we'd be keen to be a part of that. Thank you. Um, Sarah Boyack and then uh, Alan Laidlaw. I was actually just going to pick up that point of the next CAP reform and doing a post-match analysis on where we are with the current CAP payments and LFAS payments, which um, I think we're nearly at 50% for some payment. So there's obviously a major pressure in the farming community. Um, but to try and broaden that out to think about um, the point you make there about local food procurement, um, shorter regional supply chains and thinking about the connectivity. This is the rural section we're having a discussion with, but the urban part of Scotland is disconnected from this discussion entirely. And I wonder if that's a problem in terms of the priority we give to that discussion about agriculture funding, you know, the, the Nourish Agenda about um, linking this with food poverty, food quality, 
and actually getting a much more integrated approach that potentially this committee could, could lead with. And the CAP reform is the, the place to have that discussion about farming in terms of food production, but also flood mitigation, flood management. There's, there's a whole raft of things buried in there, I think. Um, Alan Laidlaw, Mike Russell, Sarah Jane Lang and Pete Ritchie, in that order. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah Boyle just made a significant part of my point. And, and I think from an agricultural point of view for this committee, it would be really good to see that all of the benefits of agriculture are, are thought about in the widest sense, the land use strategy, flood mitigation, ecosystem services, health agenda, you know, natural, um, biodiversity and natural habitat are all important aspects of agriculture. But at times, and this committee has seen more of it probably than anyone else, it's a polarised debate, forestry versus agriculture, flooding versus agriculture. And, and I think from a committee point of view in the future, it would be great to see that strategy and that discussion being looked at the highest level. And, and I think it's all too easy to go down um, quite uh, sort of simplistic routes on that and become quite polarised. Agriculture has got a lot to offer all of these agendas if done correctly and, and Patrick was very clear about you know making sure support in the future delivers wider public benefits that we all believe are important rather than just uh, minor sort of issues. Okay um, Mike Russell then Sarah Jane. Convener are we going to be dealing with crafting separately? Not because, really no. no. Okay fine because I just wanted to raise a point in Patrick's submission as yeah. well as raising a point. Come back in fact. Well, raise a point that. with Claire yeah. but yes. um, Patrick's submission, the issue of codification of crofting law, I think, is a, an issue that others, particularly former ministers around this table, would want to see happen. But there is a quid pro quo in this, which is after the nightmare of the Shucksmith pr process, uh, I think you would you know, have to be you know, serious, something seriously wrong with you to want to go through that again from a governmental perspective. So if there is going to be a uh, process of codification, it would have to have the support of the crofting community and be something they wanted to see, and that would mean change taking place. Because the, 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 the Shucksmith process started with great enthusiasm and ended with a, an inbuilt resistance to any significant change. And I think that was deeply to be regretted. So I think that's an issue which I, I'd appreciate your view on, because I'm keen on codification, but I think you'd have to drag the Scottish Government into it, given their experience. On um, a, a, a wider agricultural issues, um, a lot of the submissions deal with land use and the idea of a land use strategy. And the Land Commission will, I think, bring that uh, into focus. And I think many people are going to participate in it. But I was very struck, and I hope Claire won't mind me saying this, in the contrast between what appeared to be five reasonable and forward-looking points from the NUJ and the type of coverage we see in today's newspapers. You know, the Press and Journal, NFUS in last-ditch move to block land reform proposal. So I think... If we are going to take part in looking at land use strategy, again, that has to be on the basis of shared um, enthusiasm for getting this right, rather than simply when you get to the point, the point of change that has to take place, that everybody digs their heels in and simply says, oh, we're not having any of that, you know, because that's unfortunately where we keep getting to. And it's not just in agricultural matters, it happens in, in fishing matters, it happens right across the board. There has to be a keenness to negotiate and discuss change as opposed to saying we believe in change, but not for us. Um, not the NUJ, but the... Sorry, the NFUS. That's a past <laughs> life catching up with me, I'm afraid. <laughs> no Sorry. bother. Um, and uh, the, the uh, fans <coughs> with, with the typewriters, indeed. Um, Sarah Jane Lang, Pete Ritchie, Patrick Krause and Johnny Hughes will get to you all, sure. So Sarah Jane first. Actually, Alan's covered some of the points I wanted to, to make. Um, but I should say that I, Claire said that 2020 was quite a long time away. I don't think it is. And just to pick up on, on Mr Russell's point that, you know, if we are going to have um, a radical reform of CAP in 2020, then it is a journey that we'll all have to go on and we'll have to start discussions sooner rather than later. Um, agriculture is about food production, but it's not just about food production. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we are suggesting that certainly the payment for ecosystem services pays has to move up the, um, up the agenda and move from a, a largely academic discussion to, to a, a practical uh, framework 
which underpins and rewards the delivery of, of public goods. I think Patrick talked about um, moving from you know, LFAS to ANC, and I do think that ANC is, again, gives us that, that hook to move pays forward, because you reward people for what they deliver. And it might not be food production, it might be a huge range of, of public benefits. And PES allows us to move from that kind of aid to trade aspect to delivering public goods. And if we don't embed that in our ambition for CAP at the outset, we get to what Mr Russell talked about, which is just before we implement the next CAP, we're trying to desperately keep the same money going to the same people for as long as physically possible. So that, that's something that I, I think I think Scotland has the, um, the ability to be a, a world leader in, in payment for ecosystem services. Um, and I think if you underpin our approach to CAP 2020 and our agricultural strategy going forward with that real delivery of, of public benefits and natural capital agenda, then, um, then, then we could have something which, which delivers for the whole of Scotland. Thank you. Pete Ritchie, uh, followed by uh, Patrick Krause, Johnny Hughes, Jim Hume, Sarah Sherrod. Thank you very much, convenient. And I'd like to echo the points that Alex made and Sarah made about how going forward we need to make sure that the benefits of Scotland's land and seas accrue to everybody. And this idea that because you happen to be in a windy place you get the money from the wind or you're in a sunny place you get the money from the sun which you've done nothing to earn. I think is part of this whole problem. We need to be looking at how we, we look at the benefits from our natural resources flowing to everybody. And we also need to be thinking about moving towards a circular economy in our food and agriculture. We've just adopted a circular economy strategy. We're moving forward on that. We need to think, how does that apply? Because it's moving beyond productionism, an approach that you put inputs into the ground and you get outputs out and maybe produce some externalities which are good or bad along the way. So we need to shift our whole thinking about agriculture and food. Um, and Nourish's view is we need to, to, in the next parliament, we should have a Food, Health and Farming Act and we should enact new primary legislation. We haven't really had primary legislation on agriculture since the 1947 Agriculture Act and then the Treaty of Rome. Um, and we need to have a, a fundamental rethink about what is farming for. Norris did some consultations on the future of Scottish agriculture at the request of the Scottish Government. We had meetings around the country and people from communities and farmers met in those conversations and they said there were three things. There was feeding our people well, there was stewardship of the environment, and it was contributing to communities by making good work, by creating good work in rural areas, and by producing renewable energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So people are very clear, you know, that what we think farming's for has to be at the heart of this. We have to rethink what's the purpose of farming, and the EU referendum is brought into focus. If we didn't have the cap, what would we pay farmers to do? And I think we should start at that point and say, if we didn't have the cap, what would a blank sheet of paper look like? And if we could get in early with that thinking, I think Sarah's absolutely right, we could take a leadership role in reshaping the cap and thinking about getting away from this idea that we base it mostly on historical payments or the more land you've got, the more money you get. These things don't make sense anymore and we need to think about a new, a new approach. But fundamentally, if we don't connect up what we're doing when we're producing food or we're, we're, we're going out and fishing with feeding our people, then somehow there's a complete mismatch between what we're using our land for and the public good. And I think the, the land reform basis that land in Scotland should be used for the, um, in the common interest and for the public good should also apply to farming. And we should be very clear about that. It's, a, it's an activity which we support as a public because it delivers public good. And we need a new social contract between the citizens of Scotland and the farmers and land managers of Scotland. Thank you for that uh, inspiring speech. Uh, Patrick Krauser and then Johnny Hughes. Thank you. Can I just support what Alan and Sarah Jane and, and Pete were saying, but tie in with um, Sarah s talked about the, um, the rural and urban divide, which I, I, I think is fascinating. But I think what we need to be putting over to the urban population is that Scotland is a country and the CAP is all of ours money. It's not just something that, that is um, the right of, of farmers. We pay something like 80% of this public money to only 20% of the landholders of Scotland. And we pay very, very, very little of it to, um, to reward 
public goods. So, so I'll just say again, public money for public goods. And then getting on to crofting legislation, I think, you know, I mean, Mike was certainly in a, in a very key position in, in the formation of what we have now. And I certainly wouldn't refer to the Committee of Inquiry on Crofting as a nightmare. I think it was one of the most inspiring things that the, the government has done. You know, if you look at what happened in the previous bill, where it was very top-down and crofters were left feeling completely disenfranchised by it and had no support whatsoever. And then out of that mess came the idea of having a full inquiry into crofting, something that hadn't happened since the Taylor Report in the 50s. And so, so the Committee of Inquiry was a really good thing. And it took um, crofting forward hugely. And, and what, what came out of the Committee of Inquiry and became um, legislation, it wasn't entirely what the Committee of Inquiry was saying. And I should add, actually, we had a, a revisit to the Committee of Inquiry in December. We held a conference in Inverness and Shucksmith came and spoke at it and, and um, various other people involved in that process. And that's where these five points that I've submitted to the committee um, come from. All right. Okay. And if, but if I could just please say on the legislation, and you say any government would be mad to revisit this, I just say be brave because it's unfinished business. You know, very yeah, I mean, I think quickly Patrick to respond. misunderstands two points I made. One is I didn't say the Shucksmith inquiry was a nightmare. Indeed, it was set up by my predecessor. It wasn't set up by me, and I, I encouraged it. You know, uh, what happened was at the end of that process. Many of the things that Chuck Smith recommended didn't happen. And I think I regret that because I think they should have done. And I think that was a failure of nerve both by government and by the crofting community. And the second point I make is I do believe it should be codified. But the point I'm making is that that will have to have the participation, buy-in and enthusiasm, not just of the crofting foundation, if I might make that point, but of all those people involved in crofting because that will take it in well into the 21st century. But if it doesn't have that, then government would be, in my view, wisely reluctant. And I, as Sarah is not in this because she's had experience, but wisely reluctant from getting embroiled in what would simply be another fight. Okay, let's see. If, well, we can sort this out in the next parliament. Very, <laughs> very, very, just a very quick yeah, point to say dealing that it's about participation. Reform. It's absolutely about participation. And, and that's what will carry it through. Okay. Um, Johnny Hughes, Jim Hume, Sarah Skerritt. Uh, thanks, Karina. I just wanted to make a few comments on agricultural economics in relation to natural capital and ecosystem services, which has already been mentioned. Just a reminder then that the total income from farming in 2013, which is the most up-to-date figures I have, uh, 2.9 billion uh, of output in 2013, but the costs were 2.8 billion. So that gives you an idea of um, the state of agricultural economics, if you like, in, in Scotland. Now, on top of that, there was seven, 570 million in, in direct support payments. Now, you could argue that that's uh, 570 million of payments without a policy purpose. So I think it's probably that that we're talking about. And the average farm in Scotland made a loss of 16,000 pounds in 2012. So that's the kind of background of it. But of course, that is a completely incomplete picture because Farming delivers on a whole range of other things apart from the production of, of, of food. Um, and if you think of it, of, uh, if you think of that money, uh, the money we invest in the agricultural sector as being an investment, in, in a sense, in natural capital stocks um, to try and maximise the range of benefits that we get from from those stocks and th things like clean water, flood mit mitigation, carbon capture and storage, biodiversity. Um, indeed um, the stimulation of new enterprises um, then you get a completely different picture but we have not done that analysis and one of the things that I would urge the committee to do in the next in the, in the next session is is to begin to get to grips with that analysis we need to do that analysis as a country the Scottish government needs to begin to do that analysis understanding those stocks and flows not just the immediate kind of financial flows from farming so we then we can then, then we can understand how to deploy that money for, for the public good and that's not, it, it's not about either or, actually. It's about delivery of a range of benefits. As the land use strategy says, it talks about multifunctionality. So we move away from monocultures and we move away from sectors and we move towards multifunctionality 
and innovation, which is something I think rural Scotland uh, desperately needs. Um, without boring you with any more figures, I, I will leave it there, but just to say that I strongly support what the Crown of State has said, I strongly support actually what Scottish Land and Estates has said about um, Scotland potentially becoming a, a, a world leader in payments for ecosystem services. I hope the Scottish Wildlife Trust has paved the way for that with a will for a natural capital to, to a small degree. Uh, and I strongly support what Nourish Scotland has said uh, again about um, if we had a blank canvas, if we thought, how can we use that 570 million in direct support payments? How would we best spend it for the Scottish people? Yeah. Not, not, not just a small sector of the Scottish people. Very thoughtful indeed. Thank you for that. Jim Hume. Very much convenient. Yeah, I think Johnny makes some of my points uh, quite clearly. Got, uh, states with 2.9 billion output and 2.8 billion costs, but those 2.8 billion costs are money into the economy as well. Of course, that's money going towards feed merchants, that's money going towards local towns, that's money going to uh, uh, machinery merchants, etc., uh, etc. Et so th that's quite. Uh, I don't think land agencies are a big part of uh, people's costs. <laughs> Anyway, obviously, everybody's showing their bias uh, today. But, um, so it's obviously uh, CAP's a very important part of that, and uh, I think that has to be uh, remembered by whoever is in that next uh, committee. Uh, Claire Slipper also mentioned a, a point about the, the dairy uh, industry, where we looked into that, and what came clear from that was that uh, we have a lack of processing capacity in Scotland. Everybody looks at New Zealand and says, oh, well, they got rid of the payments there. But, of course, money still goes into agriculture uh, in a different way there, where uh, a large amount went into processing. So instead of just having <coughs> liquid milk, and you could say that for all commodities down to wheat, then they were able to make their liquid milk into different products and export <coughs> quite, quite successfully into Southeast Asia. So it would be interesting to uh, hear perhaps others' views of whether we should be looking at supporting in a different way by uh, processing and, of course, marketing as well. We get New Zealand products marketed on our TV screens in Scotland, so why can't we do it the other way around? Okay. Thank you, Jim. And with those thoughts, Sarah Skerritt, Sarah Boyack. Uh, thank you, Vina. Um, with what's been talked about here very uh, clearly, the, the multifunctionality of agriculture and land use demands innovation and adaptation by the workforce. And to maintain the resilience of the uh, farming sector, education and training of current and future generations, I think, is something that the committee needs to be mindful of. So we have the National Strategy for Land-Based Education and Training in Scotland 2015, which highlights the ageing workforce, uh, a need to upskill existing staff and also attract new entrants. We also have the exciting prospect um, of the rolling out, further rolling out of developing Scotland's young workforce agenda, which is bringing together schools with um, colleges and seeking to develop career pathways towards um, for individuals from rural and non-rural backgrounds. So there is a, a championing of rural, um, the rural sector and the agricultural sector in particular in non-rural schools. Um, so I think it would be very helpful and indeed perhaps imperative looking at the sustainability of the farming sector for the successor to com committee to be monitoring outcomes of these initiatives, the impacts they're having and what, what's working well and what could be done differently um, if we're really focusing here on the resilience of the rural sector. So, three Sarahs in a row. Sarah Boyack and then Sarah Jane. Yep. Uh, just a brief comment. It follows on from the last two speakers, um, just to suggest that we might want to look at the, when we're looking at cap reform, to look at the issue of markets, because that's, that's an issue for the dairy farming community. The market support is just broken, it's just irrelevant. And to look at in the 21st century what the role is of markets. We've talked about the what government might be able to do with the uh, farming industry in terms of um, procurement and local and regional markets. But there's a, a wider intellectual issue about markets. Do they work for the farming community in the 21st century? And how might we respond? Uh, Sarah Jane. Just to add to what uh, Dr Skerritt said about resilience in the farming sector, and, and I 
plea not to focus as very, um, solely on new entrants and, and encouraging innovation from the, from the next generation. Um, there's a huge um, wealth of expertise and knowledge from our current farmers in, in Scotland. And we've, we've had very successful knowledge transfer projects such as the Monitor Farms, um, and indeed we may even look at monetary estates in the future. And I think we have to make sure that they are part of an ongoing bundle for supporting resilience in, in farming. Because I mean, although we're talking about you know, a, a, a change, you have got willingness and expertise within the industry. Um, I, it's showcased every year at Carnoustie and, and, and down at the Oxford Farming Conference that you know, the Scottish, Scottish farmers um, do know how to innovate. They do know how to, to, to um, enhance what they're producing. But we have to just make sure that they continue to, to uh, be supported say, through, through projects such as the knowledge transfer schemes that Scottish Government already has. I'm concerned about time at the moment. Uh, Claire Slipper and then Dave Thompson. Thank you. Just a point and picking up on what's just been discussed. Um, but we have the Scottish Government's vision for a Scottish agriculture document, which I'm sure all the groups around this table will be um, participating in. And it's just more a plea more than anything else for the successor committee to, to look at this document, um, perhaps through the term of the next parliament, and to weigh up how all these different initiatives, how different promotions, growth boards and visions are all tying into this wider framework of, of Scottish agriculture. And that has to be taken alongside becoming a good food nation, the strategy to 2025, because that leads us you know, uh, into thinking about how people can share in this bounty, uh, because they don't at the moment. Um, so, Dave Thompson, a final point on agriculture and crofting. Briefly, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, <coughs> mention has been made of the amount of cash available through CAP and so on, but nobody's mentioned the fact that Scotland is just about the bottom of the league in Europe in terms of how much money we have to give to our farming and crofting communities. I think it would be very useful for a future committee to look at why that is the case and can it be rectified? Can we do something even within the current structures, and I'll not make any political points here, within the UK to make sure that Scotland actually gets the same as other smaller countries in Europe or more? Uh, because that would make a huge difference to the amount of cash available to everybody, and we all know that money is a huge problem. Indeed. Thank you for that uh, point. Perhaps uh, we should usefully move on to marine issues just now. Uh, taking that on board. Uh, Claudia Beamish, you want to start off? Right, thank you, convener, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I, I'd like to focus our minds on Scotland seas, which obviously in relation to our marine habitats and the National Marine Plan and how that rolls out into the regional plans and uh, how our habitats per se are protected and also how we have sustainable fisheries for the future and the range of other economic interests that all fit together in that. And I would ask for brief comments uh, in view of time today, not because this isn't important, but because we want to be sure that we cover the range uh, right the way through from um, the economy and the support for our fragile communities to the biodiversity and climate change issues in our sea. So it's really what our convener stressed at the beginning, which is bullet points from those who are here today would be very much valued. Bertie Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Good morning, Claudia. Thank you for that introduction uh, to the subject. What, uh, I'm going to bring up our single point again, and that is the use of evidence and the use of uh, making decisions on, on, on evidence base. The problem that confronts the fishing industry of Scotland at the minute can be summarised in, in a half sentence in that everybody knows about the benefits of fish and loves fish, but doesn't actually want anybody to catch any. Um, on the matter of marine protected areas and habitats, they are vitally important. And it is extremely important that, that the marine environment is stewarded properly. However, it needs to be productive. And therefore, at each point of decision as to what is enough, what is enough to, make the, to meet the conservation objective and wherever possible to meet the objective of continued sustainable use of the sea, that, that, that balance prevails. That has not been the case uh, uh, in, in a small amount of the MPAs. Now, I'm going to emphasize it's a small amount. 
the whole MPA process was an exemplar. The Scottish MPA process was an exemplar for other nations going about setting up MPAs. The problem was decision-making in four from 20 of the first designations, which were skewed, in our view, for political purposes. And that did such a lot of damage to what would have been a, um, um, a, a truly excellent process. And so when we're going forward, of course, protection of the habitat is vital, but there must be evidence, and we must bear in mind the other statutory requirement of the Scottish <laughs> Government, which is the continued sustainable, the continued sustainable use um, of the seas for food production. That's, that's, that's the vitally important, often ignored other half. Graham Day. Uh, I, I kind of find myself agreeing with Bertie Armstrong as much as his point about it being incumbent on parliamentary committees to differentiate between evidence um, and opinion masquerading as evidence. But, but I've made the point also it's incumbent on those making the submissions to this committee or any parliamentary committee to focus on evidence rather than opinion uh, or, dare I say, self-interest where it conflicts with the greater good. And, it, you know, you reference the MPAs, but through the MPA process, and I don't mean this as a defensive point, it can be very difficult for this committee or any committee to cut through the um, claim and counterclaim that's presented to us, and dare I say, something's presented to us or a case made in a way that's not altogether acceptable. So I guess the point I would make is that we're sitting here today around this table and we're hearing measured, constructive, respectful contributions that are balanced, looking at the greater good. That's the kind of evidence we need and the successor committee will need in the years to come. Yep. I absolutely agree, Graham. And, and if we can proceed in the next session um, with that as the, as the underlying basis, then we'll, we, we'll do better. Wh wh one thing that is important um, is, is the ability to differentiate between uh, um, um, well-stated, plausible-sounding opinion and evidence. And, and, and I completely accept your point that, OK, if you're going to present evidence, make it convincing. Accept it see through the orange smoke of the flares that were let off outside the Parliament yes. to get some of the evidence over the opinion. Um, Callum Duncan followed by Alan Laidlaw. I yes, think yes. this is important. If we're, if, thank you. If we're talking about the point that both yourself, um, Bertie, and Graham have made, that to, to and I'm not, I'm not asking for responses at this point, but we have to be very careful about uh, comments which, for instance, you've just made, you know, in evidence, which is that, and I quote, um, the committee or doesn't want anyone to catch any fish. Now, I mean, that, that is sort of something that, uh, frankly, is, is... I understand where you're coming from on it, and I understand fragile communities are, are at risk, and I understand what, what that perspective is, and that there have been a dichotomy of um, evidence on, on uh, the future of our economy. But uh, I, I have to say, just for the record, that that is not the perspective that, that we're coming from, and I think it's just important to to put that on the record. It is about fishing now and the other uh, interests in the environment that the committee has been looking at that it has to weigh up and that is the sort of legacy that I would, I would hope that would go forward. Yeah, right. One Thank point. you. Uh, accepted, Claudia. The, the use of that phrase was a deliberate use of a catchy phrase. Um, Callum and I <laughs> conduct a dialogue in, 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 in public and the social media, which often includes phrases like that. Um, um, uh, underlying that, that is the fact that, believe it or not, we, we, we do have a communicative relationship. Thank you. Uh, Callum Duncan, you can now reply to that. <laughs> Ten rounds, I suppose. <laughs> right. uh, th thank you, convener. Um, I actually had the words false, false dichotomy written down prior to Claudia talking about dichotomy, and I think that's what we, we've seen in the session that's just been because we all want um, uh, healthy seas and you know the, the engine room of the seas are often these fragile complex seabed habitats that the committee has done well to listen to evidence on in our opinion and that evidence has been about the, both the features but also the status of the seas and, and the, the benefits to the seas that those features can provide if properly managed and indeed uh, recovered. So. Um, you know, actually, I think the, the four sites being referred to themselves were a form of compromise that some stakeholders didn't think went far enough, and it's worth putting that on the record. And we've made a submission about Loch Unit to Sound of Jura. We support the order for that, but we, you know, there are compromises in there that are now a matter of record. Um, 
In terms of going forward, um, you know, to, to, to depolarise this, I mean, I think, I think the MPA process uh, brought a lot of things to the, to the head because a lot of man matters around inshore ma fisheries management has, has been a can kicked down the road because there was recommendations as far back as 2006 to address spatial management of um, fishing, scallop dredging in particular. So uh, to, to get those win-wins, we all need to work together um, for uh, the, the, the outcome that we want, which is sustainable, well-managed inshore waters. And I hope the, uh, the next committee will support progressive strategic ecosystem-based um, fishing management, allowing equitable, sustainable access. But I'd also like to bring in um, the regional marine planning process and the opportunities there um, in order to deliver um, uh, sustainable management to, um, to, to deliver uh, uh, the just uh, communities living within environmental limits. Um, and, and just to, f to finish, I think, you know, obviously as part of the MPA review process, we've got another round of um, management measures that need to come in. And I think this, you know, we, we could, hopefully in time we can, we can break this false dichotomy by getting more evidence of the benefits. And that's very much what we, what we would urge, to use this opportunity, this historic opportunity, to research with these MPAs in place to see the benefits that they provide in terms of sustainable food provision, the scallops and the, the juvenile cod-like complex seabeds. It makes sense to protect them in terms of some of the other benefits uh, Johnny mentioned but at sea, nutrient cycling, carbon capture, coastal protection. Um, we're seeing politics aside some really encouraging evidence from Lamlash Bay um, and some of the research opportunities that's providing. So we'd really encourage that in the next session to make the most of this historic opportunity um, so everybody can, uh, as, as Pete was talking about, um, gain benefit from this public good going forward. Can we uh, take a couple of bits of evidence from Alan Laidlaw and Johnny Hughes and then Dave Thompson? I, mean, I think it would fit that way. Yep. Thank you, Convener. I think it's, it's really important to think of the marine environment in its whole. The committee is extremely well versed in discussions about land and land use and has developed a, an expertise in, in marine issues. All too often people take them at quite a simplistic view that I like the marine environment to be used for my single interest. Mm -hmm. Again, it's deer versus trees versus farming, just it's wet deer and supposed to dry deer. And, and, and from my point of view, being involved in both onshore and offshore uh, land management, whether it's wetland or dry land, you have to look at it in its entirety. And when you look at a, a coastal area, it's very easy to see that nothing is happening on a piece of water at the moment that you look. But that could be one of Bertie's members' very important areas, or it could be one of Callum's interested parties' very important habitats underneath. Or it could be a great natural capital resource, or it could be a great community resource. And people very often take a hugely simplistic approach to it. And where community engagement done well with capacity seeks proper views, it can be fascinating how quickly totemic issues can disappear because actually there's a greater understanding. And I, and I think all too often on the marine environment, it's a very simplistic approach. Callum mentions clearly, clearly marine spatial planning and, and uh, regional um, planning partnerships and that sort of things. There's a huge development task there to get communities engaged to what happens off their coasts. There's a huge capacity job there in terms of being able to, to service those discussions. Um, but it's really important to get right. And I think from a legacy point of view, I think that um, government and, and this committee in particular is in a really good position to say, how do we draw strands together? How do we look at it in a, I hate the word, but in a holistic view, you know, 20,000 foot view at what actually we want to see Scotland's natural resources delivering. And it's exactly as Johnny says, there's multiple benefits to be delivered from the same piece of ground if done properly. If done in a simplistic approach, we can make a mess for everything and, and you'll have more dreadful evidence sessions that you don't want to be having. So that's my plea. Uh, Johnny Hughes. I just want to start off with a couple of pieces of evidence um, in relation to the marine environment. So in, in, in 1883, sorry, India, in 1883, there was a map of the North Sea that showed a oyster bed 20,000 square kilometres in extent. By 1936, it could not be harvested. And by 1970, it, it was completely gone. 
In 1948, 40,000 fishermen worked in the North Sea, achieving a peak catch of 1.2 million tonnes a year. By 2008, there was just over 10,000 fishermen working in the North Sea, and they were catching half that tonnage. Now, you've heard the arguments for the protection of the marine environment from, from the environment sector, to loosely call us that. Um, but I think in, in, in recent years, we've been increasingly making the social and economic arguments for the, for the protection of our, of our marine environment. And I, I do think we need to understand the shifting baselines here. You know, how, how far are we going? How, how far have we understood, really, the extent to which we have damaged our marine environment and, and the extent to which it needs to be recovered? Um, I, you know, sometimes you look at, you know, we're looking back on five-year timescales and thinking, oh, and five years ago we were in this situation. Why can't we be, you know, catching as much fish now? We have a massive recovery job to do to increase production in the future. And I'll put it on the record now that the Scottish Wildlife Trust want Scottish fishermen to catch more fish. We want the Scottish Fishing Federation to enable their members to catch more fish. But in order to do that, we need to recover the marine environment first. It's exactly the same with the deer issue on land. We need to bring deer numbers down to the point where we're getting primary productivity on land rebounding, so we're getting forests regenerating, so we have healthier, more productive, stable populations of red deer in the future. It's exactly the same scenario. We need recovery, and we need to understand how far we've gone in terms of damage to our environment and how far we need to go on the road to recovery. And maybe that's something that the, the committee could look at in the round, is this, is this baseline issue, because it's, it's often misrepresented. And uh, Dave Thompson? I agree totally with Johnny and with Callum and what they've been saying about uh, uh, research in particular, because one of the things that really struck me in, in the whole debate about the MPAs was the almost total lack of any real evidence and research on the West Coast in particular. And we talk about evidence. But there is so little evidence. How can we make proper judgment? So one of the things I would agree with is that there needs to be a lot more research done, particularly in the West, but also in the East. And quite often the science lags behind reality. The seas are changing, and they change all the time. And sometimes the seas are ahead, and science is a year or two behind, and we're basing decisions on slow science. Now, I know that science maybe can't be, uh, well, it can't be ahead of reality, but we need to take it a bit closer to what's actually going on. So I would make a plea that there needs to be greater investment in research so that we really know what's going on in our seas. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Mike Russell wanted to come back on something, perhaps on land, maybe. But no, no, I wanted to come back on. I mean, although I think we'll have an opportunity to talk about deer in a moment, and I think that's going to be very important to talk well, specifically have to be, yeah. about deer. But I just wanted to make this point about evidence-based policy making, because I think that it is incredibly simplistic. Uh, you know, the, the idea that this committee or government sits in platonic or Socratic wisdom deciding between very clear cases one side or another and in the end uh, delivers its verdict is bunkum. You know, the reality is there is an incredibly complex mix of players. I mean, John just told us about what the environment was in one part of the North Sea in 1883. In order to understand the evidence, you will have to have a complete set of evidence, not a partial set of evidence. What this committee does is, I hope, and what a successor committee should do, is try and balance the evidence with which it is presented, which is, will always be partial, with the passion that people feel about what they do. And I recognize the passion of those, uh, my constituents in Tarbert, for example, faced with an MPA process that they thought was immensely flawed and should have been operated far better. And also the passion of people in Arran and elsewhere for trying to change the marine environment and the view of the government that has a vision of taking it forward and the requirements of EU law. This is a, a cat's cradle. Uh, and what the, this committee needs to do is to find a way forward so that Scotland is the better after its considerations. And that's not just sitting deciding uh, blandly or bloodlessly on paths of evidence. It is engaging what is taking place. And in Patrick's words, it's encouraging participation so that in the end, the solutions found are those that everybody or almost everybody can buy into and believes that they have influenced. That, would, that is the right way forward in my view. And that's what any committee should try and do. So to 
draw this to a kind of a close, I hope. Um, Callum, uh, Bertie and Claudia for the last word at the moment. Yep. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I see, I echo what Johnny said about the uh, imperative for recovery in the sober government report, Scotland's Marine Atlas, which is best available ev ev um, evidence, makes clear that need for recovery. Um, very much support the point Alan made about um, wetland and dry land. What we need at sea is proper spatial management. Um, and just to quickly pick up on Dave's point, we actually have, we actually have a lot of pretty much a lot of evidence of presence of features. We, we, we do have a, quite a lot of that. What we've got less evidence of, we've got less evidence of presence further offshore, but we've got very little evidence of uh, benefits. But we're seeing very encouraging stuff coming through from Lamlash and elsewhere. Um, so really would encourage, as we all agree, I think, further, further research to realise those benefits um, and, and demonstrate those to people who might be sceptical. Bertie Armstrong. And Thank you very Claudia much. I, I think Jonathan uh, illustrated what I meant about the, the, the general nod towards you, you don't want anybody to fix that. that that's an entirely predictable narrative, which is a, an objective tale of woe uh, by uh, disasters foregone and, and therefore uh, an, an emphasis on, on non-specific objectives of, of recovery, which of course implies if one MPA is good, two is better. If, if, if a big one's good, a huge one's even better still. The, the evidence is somewhat different. Of course the seas have changed since 1880, and there's a perfectly plausible story as to why. Uh, a lot of it was indeed to do with overfishing, but uh, with regard to 40,000 fishermen in, in, in the 1880s, there are five now thousand fishermen. The, the uh, fishing mortality curves from the relevant scientific body from ISIS are, are, are all showing a 45 degree downward slope and the biomass of the fish stocks are showing the opposite 45 degree upslope. So if we don't get it wrong again, there is distinct hope that, that your, your bottom line of, of, of there being more from a productive sea is entirely possible. Um, I, I would dispute uh, Mike Russell's description of, of the, the, the evidence being um, excessively complicated and therefore rather arcane. In the matter of this South Aran MPA, the, exactly where the features are is known. Um, the recommendation uh, supported by SNH was that a zonal management take place and that fishing take place in some areas well clear of the features. We're not looking and, forward. But it's, it's, it, it, it's to answer the point about, about evidence. The evidence is generally reasonably clear. And the problem with the evidence presented uh, uh, with regard to MPAs was the socioeconomics. And that silly trick of grossing up was, was, was made. It's only 0.2% of, uh, of fishing, therefore it must be small. If you look at the Highland Smelter, it, it was only 0.2% of Scottish GDP, but it was a disaster in Inveramond. It's only a small amount of damage to the Scottish fishing uh, uh, industry, but it's a great disaster for your local uh, uh, um, constituents who made that perfectly clear to you. I think um, we need to be... To be, fair, sorry, to be fair, I argued strongly their case and the way in which they'd been treated by Marine Scotland. But I think, Bertie, you have just proved how evidence is not simple, can be complex, and sometimes is difficult to understand. I let the official report stand as evidence of that. Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. I think this has been a helpful discussion. It's shown that there is still uh, uh, quite, a, quite a dichotomy in uh, issues around, marine, uh, around our marine environment. But I do actually believe very positively, having taken a particular interest in this, along with many others on the committee and beyond the committee, that we're much closer uh, from the different interests who think they are different than, than, than they actually believe. And, and the, I think that research and, again, like with land use issues, um, for our marine environment, participation by the communities and by those who have an interest. And let's not forget there's also the challenges of oil and gas and there's the challenges of renewables, there's the challenges of all the other interests and, and marine tourism as well. A whole range that I'm not going to go into now, but I think that if those interests and perspectives as well as making an effort to uh, be sure that they contribute to the evidence and the science, actually make 
the most enormous effort to understand each other's perspectives. I think um, that would be a legacy from outside this committee, which would help the successor committee itself to actually take forward marine issues for now and for the future. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for that. Uh, it's clear that some of the bases of things we do are the land use strategy. Uh, we have a marine plan, but a marine use strategy which kind of matches the land use strategy would be a good thing, I think. And uh, there are many other things that we've learned from this morning, uh, not least that uh, when you get a chance to speak, you bring together ideas which, as Claudia says, show that we actually can work together in a fashion that can reach uh, what we hope are uh, ways that would allow us to move Scotland forward and to recognise where the strengths are and also where the passions are and the ability is. Uh, some people have spoken more than others, but I think each sector has a huge part to play. And I'd like to thank this committee for your evidence in the past for your evidence this morning and recognise one final point which Graham Day is going oh, to make. Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, this committee has made a concerted effort over its five years to try and get witnesses who've worked at the coalface of organisations who understand the practical aspects of the subject they're providing evidence on. I, I argue that to some degree we've been successful in that. What we've come nowhere near uh, to succeeding on is striking any kind of gender balance in our panels. I mean, today, out of 15 witnesses, we have three women. And that's no blip. The 107 witnesses that have appeared before us since May of last year, 89 have been men, just 18 women. That's an 83-17% split. So I wonder if I can ask uh, to, for help in informing this process, uh, witnesses, why they think the panels attending RACI committee hearings are so male-dominated? Is it the case that your organisations contain too few women in positions of sufficient authority and specialisation to be put forward to give evidence? Or is there any kind of inbuilt prejudice at play when it comes to selecting representatives to attend evidence sessions? That is a thought that you can take away with you. Um, and uh, I, and uh, I'd like to... I'd seriously like to thank you all for being uh, such useful witnesses over the piece. And uh, we'll, we'll have to end this particular session at the moment. We have covered rural development. We've had some biodiversity in it. We've had marine and uh, agriculture and land use issues. We've had quite a good round table in that respect. So thank you very much. We will now suspend the panel and uh, change over for the next one and take a break.
Uh, we're going to reconvene now, so uh, please sit down, those of you who are taking part in the second section session this afternoon, this morning, or we'll going to the afternoon, no doubt. So, um, we continue with uh, agenda item one, which is our legacy process, and welcome back uh, uh, members of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment consider uh, Committee are considering legacy, and we're joined by the second panel which uh, includes uh, some previous witnesses um, who I will just quickly run through. Sam Gardner, Andy Kerr, Ian Gilland, uh, Colin Campbell, uh, Tom Ballantyne, Willie McGee and Stuart Goodall. And uh, I welcome you all here. Many of you have been witnesses before, so we're not going to do any introductory uh, matters just now. But we are going to try and cover subjects such as um, the RPP3 and annual climate targets and reports, uh, forestry, biodiversity, air pollution, sustainable development, circular economy, a lot of things to cover in the next hour. And as I said to the previous panel, um, many of you were asked for bullet points and some of you wrote treatise. Uh, and uh, this committee in this hour, bullet points only, not treatise. And uh, so we must try and focus. So it is a legacy paper, not looking at the past, but trying our very best to make sure that uh, we give the next committee a clear steer. So um, I'd just like to kick things off by saying um, we need to think about RPP3 and uh, how... Uh, climate change targets and so on are actually going to work, how things have worked, um, how government should be prodded uh, to try and make them work better and how the whole community, business, private, local government, public sector, private sector, all of these bodies need to work. So with that sort of very general statement um, from myself, I wonder if anyone would like to, to kick off, just make yourself known to myself or the clerks and we'll bring you in. So, um, Sarah, did you want to... Shall I turn it into a question? Yeah, um, uh, even better. And ask the witnesses whether you think the Parliament and our committees do enough to scrutinise progress in climate change. As Rob said, we've missed our first four annual targets. We are responsible for looking at agriculture. We're not responsible for housing, energy, transport, business or the economy or fiscal mechanisms. Um, and in our committee report in the last couple of years, we've highlighted the difficulty of scrutinising the climate change element of the annual budget. So is there more the Parliament could do or is it up to this committee? Um, and it's what should the next Parliament do? Is this an issue for our legacy paper or how do the other committees get involved? Thank good, you. good question. Um, Sam, do you want to start? I'll try. Thank you. Yes, a good question. Um, I think uh, it's first it's appropriate to acknowledge just how, not that it needs uh, identifying, but how cross-cutting climate change is and the challenge that that presents to the committee. Um, I think there are examples where other committees have clearly taken a lead. The ICI committee in its scrutiny of the budget this year and last year uh, focused particularly on climate change, and that was very welcome. I think the challenge for a future committee in this role is being able to aggregate the, uh, the conclusions from subject committees in such a way that we don't divide the Climate Change Act and its delivery into its component parts and lose the coherence, the glue that might hold it together. And that is where I see the critical role for this committee. And I think it has sought to do that. I think with the scrutiny of RPP2, uh, every effort was made to try and uh, collate and bring together evidence from subject committees I think it's challenging to do that on a continuous basis, but that needs to happen. Otherwise, we lose that assessment of the coherence of the RPP, the extent to which different sectors are contributing fairly to the challenge of tackling climate change, um, and we miss that overview of its effectiveness of its delivery. So there is an important role for this committee in its future um, in providing that assessment of the whole and whether or not it's adequate and whether or not delivery is happening as it ought to be. So, Graeme Day wants to come in on that. Yeah, thanks. Just picking up on that point from Sam Gardner. Um, given the wide-ranging remit of this committee, do you or any other panellists think there is an argument for having a standalone climate change and environment committee in this parliament? 
Anybody? Andy, Kerr? And then we'll have Colin come in. And... Um, I would say, actually, rather than climate change and environment, if you're, if you're seeing what's happening behind the scenes within the government, they're starting to join up. So RPP2 was very much bottom-up. RPP3, they've actually commissioned a lot of work to try and join up across the whole energy environment space um, with their times modelling framework and a bunch of other things, which allows them to start to look across different sectors. Um, so rather than climate change and environment, actually a climate change and energy um, thing is a more coherent thing. And I know we've been there and we've moved away. Uh, to me, that's a more coherent thing to have going forward. Thoughts on that from board? So, Colin, can yeah, I mean, on, on, the, easier, sorry, on the latter point, I think um, there is, uh, there's always a danger of siloing some of these topics. I mean, climate change is something that affects all the issues you were discussing in session one, for example, and adaptation is just as important about mitigation. We know we have to, we know we have to adapt, and that's fundamentally linked into all the discussions you had about natural capital. I think it's a danger then that you, you can silo the, the, the debate and not take into account the wider aspects. I think in relation to Sarah's question, I think there is a need to actually look in greater detail at some of the, the new measures that are coming forward for trying to mitigate uh, greenhouse gases. So there are new measures coming forward on compulsory soil testing, um, trying to increase the efficacy of animal health um, treatments, for example. These are new weapons in the armoury that are being played, but we need to examine the evidence around how well and how effective they're going to be in the future. Um, so uh, Sam Gardner to come back a bit, and then Stuart Goodall come in after that. Oh, it was really, Andy um, said, I think, what I was going to say, which was a climate change and energy committee uh, makes kind of sense in the context of, certainly, like Andy says, how the Scottish Government are approaching the development of RPP3. I think uh, this committee has clearly been, uh, got a huge breadth of responsibility, and climate change, with its all-encompassing nature, uh, is deserving of um, a more singular focus, if you like, to, to, allow it, to allow a committee to be able to provide that leadership role on a cross-cutting topic. And uh, can we have um, Stuart Goodall now? Thank you. I, I think both points uh, can be linked. I, having a you know the committee like this putting a spotlight on climate change uh, and challenging government, I think is extremely important. And being able to do that in areas such as forestry, where a big issue in terms of contribution to climate change mitigation is the planting targets, by having the committee shining a light on the fact that we're not delivering on something which is achievable, I think will help in terms of galvanizing the agencies involved um, in the whole area of approving and uh, delivering on, on planting targets. I think that's an extremely important role that the committee can play. And I think that also highlights the fact that it's beneficial having climate change linked in with other parts of uh, you know, Scottish Parliament's responsibilities which are key deliverables. So forestry planting is one of the big positive things that uh, government can do to generate activity, economic activity, as well as reduce climate change. It's part of the rural affairs agenda. So having that ability to look across, I think, is extremely useful as well, and then come up hopefully with some um, joint solutions. Tom Ballantyne, would you want to comment on some of these things? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I can only give a kind of a broad answer, which is that... Um, the more time we devote to the subject, clearly, the better I feel about it. But alongside that, I'm very conscious of my main message for today, which is about uh, linked thinking between the Cabinet, the Cabinet subcommittee, departments, committees, and, and the whole range of agencies that are looking at this. And to me, the most important role this committee or any successor can, can play is in achieving that linked thinking, pushing that linked thinking, and also getting read across, which is my second big bullet point. You're asking for bullet points. That would be my second one. The idea that we have to have that read across from the RPP to the budget to delivery and then auditing of what, what's going on. And I guess with that is the idea that I've seen some fantastic work from this committee in pushing for action on climate change. And what I would like to see in the future is successor committees following up on the kind of work you've done, seeing whether the actions you suggest, suggested have actually been taken and being proactive in trying to make sure those actions have been taken. Uh, Mike Russell next. Hi. Tom's point is an absolutely crucial one, which is to get that joined up, that link thinking, and to know, you know both in government and in the parliament who has the lead responsibility of forcing that issue. 
I think in governmental terms, the time has certainly come for that to be seen as a cabinet responsibility with a cabinet secretary taking the lead on that. I know Richard has the overall responsibility, but I do think it is important to drive that. And in, government, in parliamentary terms, I think this committee needs to play an even more prominent role in forcing the issue with other committees. I mean, certainly my own experience in government and you know, as, as a member of the Scottish Parliament is that without somebody essentially taking it on and delivering it, then the temptation is to think that it can be done in a future year, it can be done by somebody else. And I think given the urgency of the matter, that would be a major change that the successor committee would want to see and would want to encourage the government to put in place very early on. Indeed, it might be something, I don't know what the demands of organisations around this table will be in the manifestos, but it's something that certainly I hope will be thought through. Sarah, do you want to come back at the moment? Yeah, yeah I think that's been really good getting people's views. Um, and I kind of wanted to just provoke that thought just to see what people thought we could do that would be better. And I, I take the point that it has to be both mitigation and adaptation. And this committee has been looking at both, thinking of flooding, forestry, agriculture, land management, peatlands. There's a lot in there. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about was both urban and rural Scotland, um, thinking about how this works regardless of where you are in the country. And I think Mike's comments about how government needs to have a focus, um, I think the parliament needs to shadow that in effect. And I think in the last term, um, we had slightly different committee structures, so it's worth reflecting on, but you also had a cross-party group on climate change. We haven't had this, that this time round. So it's left everything up to this committee. And I feel given the huge responsibility this committee has, it's a question we should put down for the future for the parliament, um, both at the political level and in terms of the clerking system, but how we cope with this. Indeed, um, we've had the, the problem of engaging other committees that are big carbon users, such as justice, uh, health, and so on, and getting them to actually understand their responsibilities or even measure these things has only come through our own interrogation of public agencies like the police and so on. Those committees should have been doing that kind of job. Uh, does anyone want to come back on those points just now? Uh, but we're, we're kind of aware of them. Yes, Sam. The, you've made a clear effort to mainstream the climate change scrutiny process uh, in recognition of the challenge of taking it all on and the fact that committees, uh, subject committees, bring evidence that's relevant to those particular topics. I think uh, there hasn't been um, checks and balances that have assured that those committees have fulfilled the, the requirements of that mainstreaming. So through, throughout the budget process, I highlighted one committee that was particularly strong on it, but others have paid much less heed to the climate change relevance of their budget scrutiny. And there is a dilution as those, scrutiny, those different committees report back to the Finance Committee about what eventually appears in the Finance Committee's report in, with relation to climate change. And I think uh, acknowledging that and finding steps to try and provide, to provide greater assurance that climate change features more prominently, either to acknowledge where spend is right or where it needs to be to shift it, but to ensure that it features prominently in the Finance Committee's report is going to be really important going forward because to date, we certainly haven't had the confidence that the budget has aligned with the Climate Change Act. And I don't think the Finance Committee has uh, taken on board the centrality of what you're talking about. But the, the pressures are different, Sarah. And post Paris, yeah. 2016 to 2021, those will be the critical years, and the EU is not going up to 42% by 2020. So we've got a potential of a leadership role, but it's the ambition and reality and I think our test ground is the reality, and I think this committee could be crucial, or successor committee could be crucial in following all of that through, so it's, it's really good getting people's views. Colin? Yeah. Just picking up the point Sarah made about the urban agricultural divide, I think there is a great deal to connect them much more than we have in the past, and um, I mean, the agricultural um, sector often feel um, very much under pressure and unappreciated by the urban community. And the urban community have view, negative views of the urban uh, the agriculture. But the reality is that in, in the central belt, for example, people are still very, very close to farms in rural areas. They're often not the best farms in rural areas, but they're still very close to them. And there's an opportunity to actually connect the urban and agriculture together much more by th actually thinking about that problem and how do we solve it, because it's fundamentally important to get support from the urban population for what we're doing in the agricultural sector. Um, we, you know, at this stage, I suppose, in a way, 
we might want to think a bit about uh, circular economies and things like that too, because um, it was nice to see um, the whey from a cheese factory being used by pig producers, you know, uh, the kind of things which are little links in the chain that I was uh, seeing last Friday in Tain. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, tied in with the RPP and the annual climate targets are behaviour change and so on. And the way in which that happens, I suppose, is something which uh, ties very much in with the kind of policies that the government has been taking. So Ian Gulland might want to yep. kick off uh, that <coughs> part I, of it. Thanks, Chair. Well, it's quite interesting there because, uh, obviously, just to highlight uh, work that we did last year, that moving to a circular economy will have a significant impact uh, in reducing uh, carbon emissions as well in Scotland, you know, far more than just thinking about it as waste management. Uh, so it does emphasise the, the opportunity for Scotland, not just uh, in terms of the environment more broadly and the economics, but, you know, in terms of the climate change position and leadership uh, adopting a circular economy here in Scotland. And it is it's very similar in, in that conversation because the circular economy is cross-cutting. It's, it's more than just the environment. It is much more about uh, economic opportunity for Scotland as well in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, stewardship as well of uh, the natural environment. And we heard a lot in the last session as well about agriculture and even fishing. And the marine environment is about those assets that we have here in Scotland, natural assets here in Scotland, how we use them. So for me, there's it's, it's a lot of similarities uh, in this conversation about how do we uh, ensure that it is cross-cutting. It's not just an environmental issue, the circular economy. Uh, and I think you know, one of the things I was involved in obviously here, uh, I think 2014 was a, was a round table discussion around the circular economy, which included people from skills, people from education, people from business sectors as well. So really trying to understand what these opportunities are. So I think there is still a role for this committee to, to, to not just champion the circular economy, but to go out and reach out to these other committees uh, in, in, in the parliament to ensure that they're thinking about this, they're responding to the opportunities that are now laid out in the Scottish Government circular economy strategy, which was launched uh, just a couple of weeks ago, clearly there are opportunities uh, in, in the urban setting, the rural setting, and uh, sectors. And we've, you know, lots of evidence about the opportunities in terms of jobs, in terms of environmental benefit, and now in climate change. So it is about how do we get that cross-cutting theme right across government, right, sorry, right across the parliament, and right across government. Okay. Following that theme, uh, Graham Day and Claudia Beamish. Yeah, I'm stripping this back a little bit, uh, Ian. How do we actually explain effectively to the wider public what the circular economy is, what it means? Because um, we had a very good parliamentary debate, I think, last year here, where MSPs made a decent fist of trying to articulate what the circular economy is. We understand it, you understand it. But how do we get the message out to the public to secure the buy-in and the behavioural change that we need? Because I think we're, we're talking about it at a very high level, but how do we actually get out there to the public and, and get them to change behaviours. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I mean, it is, I think we talked about it in the session, uh, it is about language. I mean, the, the words or two words, circular economy, probably don't uh, really get too many people's attention. Uh, but in terms of the public, I think they do understand that we did, we did uh, on behalf of government, a quite an extensive engagement process in 2000, through 2015, not just with business, but with consumers, uh, you know, with young people, the whole range of people around. <coughs> basically making things last. I know that was the strap line, but it was trying to understand how people uh, are, are consuming differently, different products, thinking about what they're actually consuming so that products would last longer, they would be able to repair things, they would be able to access uh, other services in a way that would be different from what they're doing now, whether that's leasing or hiring. And to be honest, people understood that. People did really respond to that. They didn't respond to the word circular economy, but they understood nobody likes to waste anything, whether you're a business or a consumer. Nobody really wants to buy something that isn't going to last. People do understand that, and I think people... So I know it's a kind of nuance on it uh, in terms of, of the language, but it is actually people understanding they want to buy things differently, they want to consume differently, and they understand particularly things like climate change. They want to do something to really benefit climate change and, and uh, the aspects uh, that they can see writ large across the main media, uh, particularly in the run-up to Paris. And I think they understand things like circular economy, making things last longer, recycling, repairing, remanufacturing and using things longer both themselves and then passing these things on. I think the public do get that. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish, then uh, uh, Tom Thank Valentine. you, Convener. I mean, the, the points really have been raised that I wanted to raise uh, in the main, uh, but just to follow on from the points that 
you were making in and also from, from Graham Day. Uh, I would be very interested to know what the committee thinks about how to um, involve communities and, that's, um, and also um, for, for our legacy paper, um, those who, who are not on quite such um, robust incomes as, as some others and, and also households, both in understanding uh, climate change and the circular economy and what contribution they can make. Because often people will say, um, well, I'd like to do something, but I'm not sure what. And I, I know that's moved on quite a lot, but there are still ways in which um, we might be um, able to advise the future committee about how uh, we can help them to support that. So I value views on that. Um, so uh, Tom Ballantyne, then Andy Kerr. This really goes back to the point of buy into the circular economy and how do you get the public to, to buy into that idea? Well, really what I think is important for the future is that we are operating in a, in a new context when people see the kind of extreme weather events going on both in this country and elsewhere, the impacts that climate change is having on health issues, on food production, um, on all sorts of areas of people's lives. That's the way we're going to get buy-in, is when they see the impacts of doing nothing and understand that they want to do something to, to avoid the, the worst impacts we'll face if, if they don't act. And that's linked in, of course, with the outcome in Paris, which is look for that um, intention to go to 1.5 degree rather than 2 degrees. So I think that's another push, another bit of momentum for, for getting a buy-in from the public and from government. Um, Andy Kerr, Dave Thompson, Ian Gilland, order. I, I'm going to challenge that a little bit, Tom, because you know, we've had a long, a, a lot of years where the assumption has been if you can make people believe and buy into climate change, they will then do something about it. And actually, we know that a lot of people do buy into climate change, but they don't do anything about it. And the issue, it seems to me, is always we've got to, get, we've got to make it far more real for them, which comes back to the, the point that Ian has just made about the circular economy. So if you take things like the energy system, you know, we've still, certainly over the last couple of decades, still treated people as passive consumers of energy, rather than what we're trying to do, I think, now over the last few years, and particularly in Scotland, we've got some really good exemplars, um, which is to say, how can you actually get energy uh, people to take a stake in the energy sector, whether that's through actually buying into a, a, a community scheme or whether it's actually just taking an active part in saying and understanding that if you don't want a wind turbine locally, then what do you want? What are the options? It's not a thing that you can't have nothing at all. You've got to have something. So I think there is a sense that we're, we're actually moving in the right direction around getting people to start to address what will, what will make a difference to them, what are the issues for them on the energy side, and I suspect the circular economy is the same thing. But I think this notion that if only we make them believe in climate change, then they'll do something. I, I think we've got to move on. I, I'm, I'm being slightly unfair on you, Tom, there, but we've got to move beyond that, and I think we have got some very good examples around Scotland. Um, and I, I'll just pick one particular thing very quickly, you know, we know that in the rural, rural communities, um, you know, a lot of people use electricity for heating. We know 50% plus of people are going to be in fuel poverty in those situations. There are things we can do to support that, which involves bringing in biomass for heating, bringing in other forms of things, working as a community, working with farms and so on, which, which are not being done at the moment. So there are actually very positive things we can do, and we're starting to see bits of it, but we need to scale it up, and that, that to me is the issue, but it's got to be very real. From that, that I'll just bring in Tom before I come to Dave. Yeah, so, so I want to be quite clear, I'm not talking about buy-in to the idea of climate change, I'm talking about buy-in to the effects of climate change and an understanding of the effects of climate change and actually seeing the effects of climate change on the ground. So people are experiencing flooding in rural communities and in towns. They are seeing the health impacts of climate change around the world and understanding that may have implications for them. So absolutely, it's not about buying into is this happening or is it not. I actually think that argument is pretty much over. People understand it is happening. What they don't or haven't up until now seen is the effects on them and their lives. And, and that's what I think is happening. That's where the momentum is partly coming from. Okay. Uh, Dave, uh, to take this forward a bit. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, uh, convener, and welcome to the, to the panel. I, I'm, I'm just thinking how we encourage um, folk to um, reuse things and so on. And, you know, I, I, I've got a lovely pair of boots where the soles are worn through now. The leather up their uppers are perfect. They're very comfortable. And I can't get them resold because they're not designed to be easily resold. And I think it's a terrible waste, and I can't bring myself to throw them out. 
How, how do we ensure that companies who make things like that actually make them in such a way? I mean, do we use taxation? And if we think of housing, is there a case, and again it's on taxation, to reduce the amount of whatever kind of tax is going to be on properties for properties that have got a very, very high thermal, um, you know, positive thermal uh, impact? Do, do, do we adjust whatever is going to uh, succeed the council tax so that people get a 10% reduction if their home report shows that there's hardly any heat emissions? Is taxation one of the ways that people on the panel think we could go forward with in relation to this, bearing in mind that we only have limited taxation powers in the Parliament here? Right, Ian, first of all, while you're thinking about that... <laughs> Yeah, to, to jump around the community thing, because I always think there's, there's great alignment, and uh, I was looking to hear the first session as well around energy uh, and communities. I mean, waste, what was waste, now resource, it's an asset, and it's an asset that's flowing through our communities, both right across Scotland, uh, and I think it's, it's the similar aspect of putting up wind turbines and accessing economic benefit, uh, and therefore also engaging with people in you know, tackling uh, climate change as well. That's the a, that's a same opportunity of tapping into that waste stream. What was the waste stream flowing through those communities, realising those as assets, uh, whether the, set, the sale of them, but more importantly, what can be done with those materials in terms of repurposing them, remanufacturing, reusing them locally in terms of employment opportunities. That's the real opportunity for Scotland. That's what I think would really engage communities in trying to understand how we can get them to see this material is something that will bring them economic benefit, social benefit, and other things, both, both in a rural setting and in an urban setting as well. Uh, and and that, that links to the, the aspect of how do we encourage reuse uh, and incentivise it, uh, not, not trying to avoid the, the issue about taxation. But yeah, I think similarly, we have very successfully in Scotland got a huge renewables industry because, you know, I hate to use the word subsidy, but w there was a subsidy put in place to make that attractive in the marketplace where burning fossil fuels was still uh, more competitive. That's possibly where we, we, we could start to look around recycling, reuse, reprocessing materials. We still, although we have a very high recycling rate now in Scotland going forward, uh, people are engaging in it both at consumer level and businesses around buying recycled. We still export the majority of our material to be reprocessed out with Scotland. That's a huge economic loss to our, our economy. So how do we make sure that the materials that we're collecting for reuse, repair, recycling are done in Scotland? How can we incentivise that? here in Scotland and maybe something like a renewables obligation uh, certificate that was put in place for uh, wind, turb wind and wave, etc. Is that a solution perhaps that we need to think about here in Scotland to really make sure that we get those economic opportunities as well as the environmental dividends for uh, our communities? Um, Andy Kerr, Colin, Tom and uh, Sarah. Sorry, sorry, Sam. I will try and finish up. I can't read. Um, the writing. The question is yes, um, we should be using taxation to support, um, and, and, but only taxation as part of a wider set of tools because uh, um, in Scotland, like most of Britain, uh, we obsess about upfront costs, not about running costs. And so we need to be aware that in itself that isn't the only thing. What you can also do, though, is the point at which you want to change behaviour is the point at which there is disruption in somebody's life. And so if somebody's moving house, that's the time to get in and do up the house. So if you can use tax as an incentive to improve the quality of the house and ratchet it every time that house is sold, you can actually move and retrofit houses really quite rapidly up through the system, um, but not on its own in the absence of anything else because we will buy houses because we can afford them and they're in the place that we want. So. To, uh, Colin and then Tom. And then yeah, Sam. On, on the tax aspect of it, I think, I think making people realise about the, the whole system approach um, can help a great deal. And, and you give the example of the, of the shoe, but I've been giving an example from agriculture. We've been very good at breeding new crop varieties, which have increased yields enormously over the years. And uh, part of that process ended up with um, sort of barley, which was much shorter. Uh, the problem with that was there was less straw then for livestock farmers to have as bedding material. Um, whereas if you had started from the point of view that you were trying to supply two products, not one product, you would have a very different approach. That's a very sort of simple example. If you take a wider perspective, you might design something very, very different. And I think that, that back to the communication is that how do we design for the whole system and think about the whole cycle of the economy? And you need to be able to quantify the economic 
aspects at every point in the cycle to get that understanding. And the other aspect for agriculture, and I think agriculture actually is quite good at circular economy. We already recycle a lot of materials on the farm, but there needs to be a precautionary approach in relation to receiving uh, byproducts from outside of the farm cycle because they may have started out being natural, but they can get contaminated and they can become unnatural. And we need to have a precautionary approach about how, how we, we connect the farm cycle to the, the wider economic cycle. And Tom, and then Sam, and then I have a very Sarah simple Boyer. principle about the, uh, taxation, and it's a kind of, for me, a no-brainer. Reward the behaviours you do want to see, disincentivise the behaviours you don't want to see, and on that front, I'll be interested to see what happens on something like air passenger duty, um, because to me, it's self-evident that if you want to see changes in behaviour, you have to reward the behaviours you want and disincentivise the behaviours you don't want. Okay, uh, Sam and Sarah Boyack. Uh, just to follow up on that, um, the Scottish Parliament had the opportunities, I recall, to vary stamp duty to incentivise uh, improvements in energy efficiency in the housing stock. Um, that's been recently given more profile by Energy UK, um, the energy body uh, revisiting that, and I think it's an area that the Scottish Government might want to return to in the future. But I just wanted to highlight the role of regulation to complement tax, and particularly um, there are three key areas, I think, where there is growing consensus and evidence for the need for regulation to create markets. So in district heating, where we don't really have a, a, a heat district heating industry in Scotland, the introduction of regulatory measures are absolutely critical to incentivising that, reducing the costs, giving investment uh, industry confidence that they'll get a return on that, but also protecting the consumer in the long term. In the housing sector, the Scottish Government's done an awful lot of work around modelling what the introduction of minimum standards at the point of sale and rental will look like. There is cross-party support for that, and we hope in the new parliamentary term, we expect, in fact, in the new parliamentary term, that there will be consultation on the introduction of those minimum standards, just as Andy says, at the point of sale being the opportunity to uh, increase the energy efficiency of our housing stock, regulation being critical to doing that. And um, finally, in the urban environment, particularly where air quality is, is low and causing so many, uh, having so many consequences on public health, there is a clear need for regulation there. And I think... All of these obviously fit within other committees, perhaps, but there is a role for this committee in its monitoring of the RPP, which we might come back to, where there's a, often a data kind of deficit, to be able to highlight just the extent to which regulation, without being, providing the specifics, challenging the subject committee to do that, but identifying where there is a regulatory need because the current package of policies or monitoring measures aren't proven to be adequate. Um, uh, Sarah Boyack and uh, Jim Hume. Uh. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I suppose this has prompted a thought, listening to people talking about this around the table, um, that one of the things this committee hasn't done a lot of has been um, sending individual members off or sending people off in groups to go off and do mini reports and come back. And if we're thinking about the... We're just adding more and more new things to do. Um, and every time one of us speaks, a light bulb goes off in my head and thinks, that's a great idea. Um, so maybe one of the things the committee might want to recommend is for the next committee to think about um, short-term committee inquiries that come back um, rather than sending us all off around the country at the same time together. Because the, the comment that Andy made about... Um, you could change some of the fiscal measures. We actually did change in the Climate Change Act. Um, it's possible to reduce both business rates and council tax for energy efficiency or renewables installations. It's virtually never been used. I've asked some PQs on it. So your point about it has to be something that has leadership, government has to buy into it, and it would need to be part of an overall strategy. And I think that's um, the points that people have been making are really interesting about um, the kind of reality check, Dave's boots, I'm wearing a similar pair of boots. It's really frustrating. Um, and there is that repair thing that we're quite good on recycling. We've got some recovery mechanisms, but there's a, there's a gap in terms of repair, in terms of the economics and the skills, and, and just the sheer um, making that work in the market. So there's, there's a few things that we could quite usefully go back and have a look at beyond the headline of circular economy, all the bits that have yet really to come to fruition. Um, Thanks for that. Uh, Jim Hume to kind of be one of them. Yeah, yeah no, th 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 thanks, Convener. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that Dave Thompson's uh, so down at heel, but uh, <laughs> we'll, all, we'll all do a wee whip around to see if we can get my pair of new boots, seeing as they can't get them resold. No, I, I think Dave made an interesting point to you about do we penalise or, or do we incentivise? I would always 
promote incentivising regarding our, our hard-to-heat hard homes in, across Scotland. I think it was just a, a timely reminder that Scottish Rural Colleges, they did, they did some work and uh, found out that rural Scotland, uh, we have 51% of our housing stock in what's called fuel poverty. So we have a lot of action to do, so I'm glad to hear these words today. We do. Um, without opening up that particularly. But we're going to have a look at forestry and biodiversity next. So Mike Russell is going to lead on that. Thank you, convener. I, uh, I want to pose four questions, um, which are not compulsory, and people do not have to answer all of them. Do, do not attempt to write on both sides of the paper at the same time. The first of them is, comes from Confor's um, uh, submission, and it is a question of the planting targets. Um, it is all very well to say we must meet the planting targets. They haven't been met uh, in the last whatever number of years. How do we meet these? If we agree that the planting targets are essential, and I think most of us do, how do we meet them? Uh, and there are obligations on the commercial sector to do more in that regard, um, which ties into the second of Confor's points about the availability of grant funding. I think that grant funding should be available um, and should be simpler to get but the commercial sector perhaps are, are using it as a very strong excuse not to plant rather than uh, finding ways to plant. The second is the role of community. Uh, that actually features quite strongly in the submission from the Forest Policy Group. And I think they're right to argue in forestry and in, environment, and in biodiversity matters that there should be public good from public money. Uh, Johnny uh, Hughes this morning made some very good points on that, which we didn't get the chance to explore fully. <coughs> How should we structure the payment of public monies in order to get those public goods and in forestry and more widely and what is, should our strategy be in terms of involving community or increasing democratic accountability in these sectors the third is dear management i'm sorry we didn't get to touch on it this morning i think it's absolutely crucial in terms of where we're going on biodiversity and uh, tackling the issue of dear management at last after two centuries of failing to tackle it <coughs> would be a noble ambition for the next committee, I would have thought, even if uh, rather a big one. And the final, I think, point is tied up, ties it all these together, which is the question of a land use strategy. We touched on it briefly in the first section, but it is an important issue here too. Almost, well, certainly half the submissions we had uh, were mentioned the need for a coherent land use strategy. There will be a land commission established by the land re the reform bill, presuming that goes through at its third stage next week. Um, what is that commission going to do to bring about that strategy? And how will that strategy affect not just forestry, but the wider question of ensuring that we have a healthy, thriving, biodiverse Scotland, uh, and also one in which those sectors are contributing to the issues of climate change. I think that's probably enough to get started with. Well, indeed, I think, and uh, as you say, deer management is certainly a part of that, something which the committee had a united view upon when we recommended the government take tougher action. But uh, thinking about forestry and deer together are often quite a useful combination. Um, do you want to start off, Stuart? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that. I mean, I think the planting target is absolutely vital, and not least in the context of the climate change discussions that we've had. It's, it's a major plank, if I, can, if I can use that pun, in the government's attempt to deliver on climate change, the planting and also the products that come from that, which uh, lock up carbon and are a low-carbon building material. Uh, we've done some calculations to say that if we hit our targets, then we would be sequestering another 55 million tonnes of carbon in Scotland's forests. It also allows to secure a, a sector which has grown by over 50% since 2008. Uh, it's now contributing a billion pounds to Scotland's economy and employing 25,000 people across Scotland's rural areas, providing often uh, high quality, skilled, well-paid jobs in areas where there is, uh, or, you know, opportunities are limited for alternative employment. It, it's definitely achievable as far as we're concerned. I think the, what we see is the issues are that there, there's a lack of drive-through within the agencies responsible for delivering the policy. They've got lots of different uh, objectives they're trying to deliver, lots of different uh, challenges they're facing. And it can be quite easy to sort of put this to one side because it's seen as difficult. And I think part of that difficulty is perception. There were forests planted in the last century which are not what we're creating now, but it's visually what people see and it's visually what people think is going to be created. And I spend a huge amount of time 
responding to people who say, we don't want those forests that you planted last century. And I say, that's great, because that's not what we're asking for. But it's still what's expected. And we find when we take in environmental conservation organisations out, local authorities and others, to see a modern forestry planting site, they've been really taken aback by how different it is and the benefits that it provides. And uh, Mike Russell was pointing about biodiversity as well, not just about forestry. These, these forests that we're planting, I've yet to see one which has more than, say, 60 to 70 percent producing timber as its primary output, which in itself is a very positive thing. It delivers on climate change. It's a low-carbon material. It supports the economy. But those <laughs> other parts of the, the area being planted are open space. There are different types of trees. They're hugely biodiverse. So those are providing an increase in biodiversity from the previous land use. So delivering on those targets and delivering these modern productive planting is going to deliver a whole wide range of benefits. And we want to do that in a way which does work with communities. Um, you know, we are agnostic on the whole issue of land ownership, but we recognize that if we're going to deliver these modern forests, if they're going to be managed and people are starting to see them harvested, they're seeing trees coming off the hills, they're going to see lorries on the roads, they need to understand that there's a purpose behind that. And therefore, we do take it on ourselves that we've got a responsibility to explain that as well. We recently produced a, a film which is on our website. So if you've got 10 minutes spare, I encourage you to watch that. We're also producing an animation which links the, how we have wood all around us, as we can see in this building, and how that relates back to the growing of wood and the, you know, the sector that we represent. So we're very keen to step up to the plate on that. But what we want to do is to see the people that we engage with who are dealing with applications which are coming forward to talk to us and, and listen to about the benefits. We want to see the agencies providing quick decisions on these at the moment. If you put an application in, it can take two to three years to get a decision, which is just ludicrous and completely off-putting and takes up huge amounts of resource. So I could go on. I'm happy to address some of the other things, but what I don't want to do is, is hog everything just now. We're going to have an opportunity to discuss a number of these points. Um, indeed, it would be very useful for you to tweet something about uh, your film. Um, that would be very positive indeed. Graham Day. Yeah, can I just seek clarity, Mr Goodall? Bullet point three on your five points for the future of forestry says replant forest, harvest, supply wood. This is an addition to new planting. So is what you're saying that we need to plant 100,000 hectares by 2022 plus that? In which case, what is the plus that? And if we're not hitting the planting targets now, how are we going to get to the point that you're indicating we need to get to? I think it's a very important point for us, and maybe not something which is uh, really easy to explain in, in, a, in a bullet point, but essentially, in terms of carbon, in terms of future wood supply, when we're harvesting forests, you know, it's like a, a tank full of you know, water or carbon, and then you turn the tap and you're draining some away, but you also need to keep filling up, and if you want to increase that tank, you've got to be putting in the new planting. But what we're saying is, is that we're, you know, we are losing areas of forest, for example, to you know, pass to wind farms, there was planting which took place in the past in areas such as the flow country, which was seen as you know, inappropriate. You know, we're not contesting that. So, but there are also areas where we're seeing, and um, we are working with the Scottish Government on this at the moment, to identify there appears to be an increasing area of um, Scotland where there had been forests and there should still be forests again, which is not being replanted, and understand why that is. And that's really concerning to us. So it's absolutely vital that um, the current government, the next government, gets a handle on that so that where we expect there are forests which are going to be producing wood, that they are being restocked and that we're getting the new planting as well. Sorry, just to be quick, do you have a figure in mind? Do you have a figure that says by 2022 it should be 150,000 hectares? Have you got something like that, that there? Well, in terms of the planting, we're happy with 100,000 hectares mm -hmm. target. Absolutely, we think that's fine. In terms of the area that's which are not being restocked, at the moment there are figures around there. I wouldn't want to quote them because there's a danger that it could be alarmist. What I'd rather do is, is that, you know, we've spoken with the Minister about this. She's been very good at saying, yes, we've got to get to the bottom of this. We've got to understand it. And that's what you know, we want to do. And I think by the time there is a new government in place, we should have those figures and we can have that conversation. Okay. Um, Willie McGee, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about the, the targets, the, the numerical value of the targets. Um, but what the Forest Policy Group has um, been working on is looking at the, the, the different ways that you can achieve greater forest cover, um, um, greater carbon sequestration capacity, more benefits to communities, um, more biodiversity, um, and um, especially rural development. And we, we think in terms of the plantation um, targets that there's a, an opportunity which, if not being missed, isn't perhaps being exploited to its full, and that is um, to actually involve communities in this drive for greater forest cover. Um, we have this target of a million acres under um, community ownership, which the Scottish Government has signed up to. Um, and, and I think it's uh, something that the, uh, the, the next incarnation of this committee would do well to look at is in, in what way can these grants that are available now but which don't seem quite to be getting the results, um, how could they be restructured in such a way that communities could take advantage of them and to plant forests which, um, to, to our mind, um, can be potentially more diverse um, and, and by diverse, I, I, I'm talking about the, um, not just the, the species, but also the aims of, the, of, the, of forestry. We, we, we tend to have this kind of pendulum in Scotland where we've swung between, so for example, in, 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 in times gone by, Stuart, me on one side, native woodlands, you on the other side, uh, commercial conifer. And, and, I, I, and, and it's like Ian, uh, sorry, Alan made the point in the first committee meeting about integration. Um, if we can strive for more integration in land use and forestry so that we don't end up with great slabs of monoculture of one thing, whether it's sport, sheep, Sitka spruce, or, or native woodland, um, but think a little bit more constructively. I, I think that the, the message would get through to more farmers and more landowners who at the moment possibly, I'm not saying they do, but they possibly look at the grant incentives and think, well, that, that kind of forestry or that that's on offer is not for me. But if it was a portion of my holding, Jim Hume, I'm looking at you because we, we, we tried to put this sort of thing together in the Southern Uplands um, and it worked very well. Um, and we got estates, tenant farmers, um, owner occupiers, all who came in, they, they weren't planting 500 or 1,000 hectares at a time, but they were bit by bit by bit. And, and perhaps in terms of the, the actual targets themselves, if we look at um, a, a little bit of innovation um, and also greater community involvement and looking at, at local development, rural development goals, um, then perhaps that might be more attractive. Okay, Jim Hume and uh, Alec Ferguson. Thank you for that. Uh, Willie McGee, um, I should say both of us were trustees of Borders Forest Trust were, uh, in the long distance past, so we're, which did do a lot of integrating uh, farming with forestry rather than having farming versus forestry, which is quite often what we hear around the, this table. So to follow on from, from Willie's uh, point there, uh, it would be interesting to hear from as many members uh, that are around this table as possible what their views are on rather than competing for land, look at opportunities for diversifying land, and that could be, uh, as Willie's already alluded to, farmers actually getting the opportunity to perhaps plant blocks of forest, which could be uh, productive or could, of course, have uh, wider environmental benefits also. Okay. Um, Alec Ferguson and then Claudia Beamish. Yeah. Um, thank you. If I could make two points, which are like bees in my own bonnet, one of which was um, prompted by something Stuart Goodall said, which was about the loss of uh, forestry to wind farm development. My understanding is that it's supposed to be a policy that um, ensures that compensatory planting takes place. Um, I've asked several questions over the years to try and find out whether that is being adhered to. My understanding is that it's not, but uh, I think that's something a successor committee might want to look at in terms of helping to meet some of the planting targets that are being spoken about. The second point I would make, uh, I, and I'm not sure if we're coming on to flooding and flood mitigation later, convener, are we? in which case I'll leave it, but I just, well, I'll, I'll just make the point that I do believe the private forestry sector in, and indeed the public forestry sector has a huge role to play in how we address flood mitigation going forward. I don't think it has been enormously involved in these discussions at this point in time, but I think it needs to be, and again, that's for the future. But could I just leave, leave this with just one question to 
Willie McGee, I think, is that I mean, your, your vision of, of how forestry planting takes place in the future is, is, I totally understand. But how do you tie that? How do you tie that in with the need? And I think it's agreed there is a need to maintain, a, you know, a sustainable and vibrant commercial uh, forest industry, which is what it is, which is hugely important as well to rural employment. I'm very glad you asked me that question. Um, I, I think that, uh, again, if we're talking about timber, um, we, know, we know from the last five, ten years um, how susceptible our trees are in this country to attack, to pest diseases. Um, at the moment, Sitka is one that's kind of got away with it, if you like, but it's only a matter of time. Um, and, and I think that there, there is an appetite amongst the sawmillers, amongst the processors, to look at different species. And I think that um, certainly the Forestry Commission, who I would applaud for their um, diverse conifer grant, which is an attempt to get people to plant, um, albeit often exotic conifers, but, but, um, but to try and move away from this reliance, this very heavy reliance on Sitka spruce. I have nothing personally against Sitka spruce, but I think that we, we are putting a lot of our eggs in one basket. So uh, it, it's a question of um, applying, if you, like, if you look at the resources that have been expended in the last 30 to 40 years on understanding Sitka, its properties, its growing, its milling, its engineering, if we did that with other species, then we would be making a start. So, if I, could I just finish that yep. off by, by asking Stuart and yourself, Stuart Goodall and yourself, can you two work within the holistic vision that Alan Laidlaw was referring to in the first panel as we go forward? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I, and uh, I think, you know, quite simply for us, integration is the way forward. You know, it's not about forestry or farming, for example. We've got a very good event. It's not us, I should say, it's the National Sheep uh, you know, Association are putting a very good event on next week, which I'm going to, which is about how sheep farmers can look at forestry as a way of actually adding value to the land. And it's about how they can uh, put uh, you know, shelter belts in of a scale which will deliver um, a forestry um, you know, on a commercial scale, whether that's uh, a, you know, commercial softwood forestry or, or native woodland or whatever without undermining sheep production. You know, it can be done. I think what we have is we've created a sort of silo thinking over the decades, which reinforced by the way the cap is, is structured to create that uh, separation. But if we have those conversations, bring that together, we can do that. And equally, you know, as I said, when we plant new woodlands, a significant percentage of that is of diverse species, whether that's um, conifer species or, or native woodland species. It's part of modern forestry. I think that's really people helpful. who want to continue with this just now. Uh, did, was that all right, Alec? Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Claudia, Colin, Mike, and Andy. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, what, no. what I wanted to raise has been touched on, but the actual term agroforestry seems to have a, a resonance here, and that might take us later on to um, dealing with flooding and climate change as well. But as, as, as um, we've, we've talked in terms of climate change already of about, uh, 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 about incentivization, and I'm just wondering the extent to which um, agroforestry, which has come up in this committee, uh, might have a, a value in the future. So it's a quick point if people could just um, respond very briefly on that in terms of time. And oh, sorry, my other, I'm sorry, I do have another question. For yeah. the legacy, in, uh, we've touched as well on um, plant health, which the committee has done a great deal on, and I do think that's a very important um, issue, if there are any further comments on that before we move on. So Colin, Andy, and then Willie. Thank you. This actually um, follows on very nicely from what Claudia s said, actually. I mean, one of the options we've got for more trees is on farms. And uh, unfortunately, this is what we sometimes call a squeeze middle. There's many demands on it. And we need to understand the reasons why farmers don't want to plant trees on farms. And there's a lot of good work being done in this area already. Um, but there are multiple benefits. There's a lot of scientific evidence for everything that Stuart said about the benefits of, of, of trees. Um, and the, the flooding one is another one that's going to come up. But I think we've got less scientific evidence of that yet. We know theoretically that actually there's a lot of potential benefits for it. Um, so there's potentially lots of good reasons to grow trees on farms. We, we do have a long-term agroforestry experiment at uh, the Glen Sock Research Farm that the James Hutton Institute has, and welcome the committee to actually come and visit that. It's very provoking to actually see it in the field. Uh, 
the next committee in the next five years, um, because it does raise all these issues about how do you actually integrate uh, trees on farms. But it is about selling those benefits, so that there are undoubted benefits, and it's getting that across to farms that actually helps our business to have those, those benefits on, on the farm. Indeed, uh, Andy. Uh, sorry, just one yes. last point is that um, uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh Commission of, uh, facing up to climate change actually made this point that we had this polarisation of agriculture and forests and we needed to break down those barriers. Um, and we have demonstration farms for all sorts of climate change mitigation options. We, we don't have a demonstration farm for trees on farms, and that's maybe a, an option going forward. It's not a research farm, it's a real farm where a real farmer is helped to grow trees on the farm. Thank you. Uh, Andy Kerr. And okay, so a couple of the points have already been picked up, so I'll leave those. I just wanted to leave one legacy issue for the committee, which is that if you look at the emissions inventory, um, energy sector typically is the biggest single sector. After this year, rural and the rural sector essentially will be the biggest sector. That will mean the attention for the next committee will be very much on what people are doing because at the moment we have the forestry sector which is the biggest sequester huge benefit to the country's emissions targets and you have everything else which is and people will start to say why aren't you being imposed on as other business and industry are being imposed on so i think that the, the next committee needs to be aware of that as being a real rising issue as a, as a legacy point um and, and the other point i was going to bring up was, was actually being picked up already about the flooding so I'll, we'll come back to that later okay uh, william mcgee um i'm Am I, am I still on Mike's questions? Yes, yeah. at the moment. Because, <laughs> I mean, there are a couple of other things that we I'd like to try and wrap two of them up uh, to, to, to community, um, if, if that's okay. I made a point about community. Yeah. Well, it, it, it was really to, to tie it in with, um, with, the, with the land use strategy and, and also the, 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 the grants. I think the, I mean, we've talked a lot about the uh, integration. What Another thing that, that we are, are, are very uh, focused on in the Forest Policy Group is um, small-scale enterprise in rural peri-urban areas and the opportunities um, that forestry can bring. And, and that um, is for um, anything from climate change related, whether it's biomass, firewood, um, um, harvesting, and that enterprise which relies on being able to get access to these small areas. Now, the Scottish Government has been very um, instrumental in pushing one initiative through, the Scottish Woodlots um, Association. That's, that's a great boon to allowing people to access more land, the public community, um, and money's going into grants for small woodland owners um, feeds its way all the way through to um, things like social justice, um, greater control over local resources, um, and, and partly links to our point about uh, the management of the state forests. We've not touched on that. I'll kind of, I, can, I can park that. But um, we would like to see, if you like, the in the same way that in plantation targets, that if we kind of give communities the levers to take control over local enterprise and rural development, and, and part of that will come through the grant system, um, then I, I think that in terms of management and access to woodlands, we could have a, a renaissance in Scotland where other European countries are experiencing decline. We, we, we know that, for instance, in Sweden, that young people um, have moved wholesale from rural areas and forests are now undermanaged. In, the, in Scotland, we don't have quite that problem. We've got a problem of getting ownership or access to land to manage. So um, in terms of public benefit, the point about monies, public monies and public benefit, we would endorse and we would like to see much more access for communities to small woodlands areas, whether they're private, they're in private ownership, or whether they're state. We've worked very well with Forest Enterprise when they put land as part of the National Forest Land Scheme on the market, they have listened and they've, they've subdivided. They've put small lots so that local communities or businesses could access these areas. Um, and I think that this committee has played its role in that, uh, in the, in that kind of move forward. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim Hume's got a small question. It was more a, more a point to just uh, okay. following up from Colin Campbell's point that the James Hutton Institute doesn't have any demonstration farms where agriculture is integrated with uh, integrated with uh, forestry. But 
two past directors of Borders for Trust, Willie McGee and I, can have probably 20 years of experience with us plethora of farms, so contact the Borders Forest Trust. It will be on the go for 20 years. They're celebrating tonight their 20 years anniversary in this very parliament, which I'm hosting in the members' room at 6 o'clock. So you can all, all come along to hear how that's actually been happening for 20 years. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, well, um, non-pecunious interest. That, that's, that's useful information. I'd like to try and move us a bit into biodiversity, but I want Mike to be able to come back just on the, on the forestry. But before you do, um, my point, you know, and it leads to biodiversity, we need to be growing timber for building purposes. That means timber that lakes a lot more looking after. One of the species is under threat, large. Douglas fir, maybe less so at the moment. Pun? So, the red cedar? so we need to make sure that we're growing yeah. as many of these kinds of species in the commercial forestry as possible so that we will have a chance to move away from concrete and move into wood building. Because <clears throat> in the land reform discussions, we've uh, talked about having more models of uh, buildings for crofters and farmers to live in, which would be eco-friendly in the way that the Crofters Commission did in the past. <coughs> they had models for houses which they offered to people to, to be able to, build, to buy. So we need to have the up-to-date kind of versions of these. If you read back the official report, you'll see that. But my point is, are we doing enough? Because they are more expensive to actually look after, Stuart, and raise. <coughs> I, I, simple response is I think we can do all these things and we are doing all these things. Um, but just quickly on the, the issue of, you know, sort of diversity and, and diverse conifers, we had done some work recently to looking at the area of uh, spruce that's being felled and what's been replaced. And we reckon only about 40% of the spruce that's been felled and re recently has been replaced. So I think there is a lack of appreciation of just how much change is going on out there. Um, when it comes to producing something which can be used in construction, which hugely keen to see. It's a very high value. It's great in terms of climate change because it locks up that product for a long time and wood is a very low carbon building material so therefore it delivers enormous benefits and it can deliver high quality housing as well. We've got a lot of the work that um, Willie alluded to around spruce which allows us to use that and grow that for the future so that can be used especially in uh, volume housing. But then there are more opportunities to use woods you know, such as Douglas fir, Western Red Cedar. Larch is still around and will be around for, for a while, but uh, it's, not going, it's not going to disappear in the next couple of years. And these are all things which we can build with. What I would say is, is that I absolutely want to see small-scale local construction using small amounts of wood, but at the same time we want to ensure that we still feed the, you know, the mills and the others, which are the ones which are providing the, you know, the overwhelming number of those 25,000 jobs and the billion pound contribution to the economy. And there is an ability to look at um, different tree species, but they've got to be planted in volume. What we can't be saying is, let's plant a couple of hundred here and a couple of hundred there. You've got to do something on a strategic basis, which means if we're delivering those planting targets, we are looking at the forests that we have if we want to introduce greater diversity, it's got to be on the basis of producing a volume of those trees and not just a sprinkling of different types, because it won't work. Mike, do you want to come back on some of this? Just now? Yes, um, I'm, I have to say that meeting the target it seems to me the biggest objective, and I hope that the successor committee will examine very closely why that target hasn't been met and how it can be met, because everything else really pales into insignificance. If you can't meet that target, then not only jobs are at risk, but the contribution you're making to uh, climate change is, is greatly diminished. Um, I think that Willie's uh, strictures about involving the community are where things will need to go. I mean, that is a personal opinion, but I do think that the involving the community in more creative and constructive ways, meeting the objectives of increasing the amount of land under uh, community ownership, whilst contributing to the targets and using public money to do that seems to be win, win, win. And I think it can be done constructively without losing sight of the strong needs of the commercial sector. 
And there's no reason why the community cannot be a key player in the commercial sector as well. And that adds another dimension to it. So I think there are all sorts of things that can be examined by and, and supported by a successor committee, but I do think it's a matter of urgency. Year on year, we say, oh gosh, we haven't met those targets again. I think there now has to be a determination to meet them uh, in the early part of the next parliament. And that will also be part of the land use strategy issue, which we need to get a grip of, because there are so many issues coming in there. And whether or not that is all done by a demonstration on Jim Hume's farm or not, I really uh, don't really care, as long as we get it done and we understand how those things can be done. And we will now move on, convene, I think, to dear management, which I'm I happy to contribute to. I think we need to do something about that too. We do indeed. Well, very much the biggest predator of <laughs> growing trees. Um, dear management, but also nature directives, the way in which they operate, uh, biodiversity, you know, requires us to be thinking about um, how we practically apply these things because we're always under pressure to make sure that uh, we aren't getting into infraction uh, at a European level. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to give any leads in this, but I really think that the dear management thing requires this committee, uh, this panel, to sort of give us some of their views about how they think we're done and how, what more we should do. So who wants to start about that? Willie. Well, at point number four, I hope we stuck to our bullet point um, layout well. And our, um, our majoring on deer control, um, we, we, we've been at it for the last half a dozen years. Uh, we do not believe that um, the current system of deer management plans is enforceable. We don't believe the SNH is equipped to, um, to either provide solid policy support or the re resources to use its powers effectively. We do recognise the very positive role that this committee has played. It is the, um, if you like, the from our standpoint anyway, the star achievement of this committee, because without intervention, we wouldn't have gone as far down the route as we have done. Um, we know that there are deer management plans. Um, the standards are supposed to be being improved this year, but we don't believe there are any prospects of meaningful follow-up. So what we would um, urge is that the successor to this committee continues to hold the baton of deer and to continue the good fight because we firmly believe that this committee has been instrumental in moving deer policy along. Thank you for that. Um, I can assure you it becomes more complex when you look at it on particular pieces of ground, as I know to my uh, interesting regret. Uh, Graham Day. Thank you. Flattery will get you everywhere, Mr McGee. Um, I visited uh, Gwanaiwa Forest last Friday there um, and I was struck by hearing about the challenges that, that the forestry sector face in regard to deer management. But I was also struck in the wider biodiversity aspect where they're actually constructing habitats for wildcats. So I'm interested briefly we can touch on what work is proactively done in forests to, you know, to, to look at the wider biodiversity issue. But on a negative, I hosted an event in Parliament last night on the use of neonicotinoids in agriculture. And in the course of the discussion, the use of neonics in forestry was referenced. So um, I just wonder if you could comment on that. It was a new one on me also, I have to say. I don't think I can comment on it. And just quickly on the... On the um, was it wildcats that you were, you, you, you were talking about? I mean, I, I haven't heard about the the work that's being done. But I think that Johnny, in the first session, um, hit the sort of the deer problem fairly and squarely on, on the head. And the issues that were in many people's papers about restoring the uplands or regenerating forests would all fall into place if, if we had greater deer control. Neonicotinoids in forestry, I'm sorry, I, I'm not really, Stuart. Um, I, I, no. I can't, <laughs> I can't add much on to that either, unfortunately. I, I mean, what I would make the point is, is that pesticides, chemical use in the forestry sector is something that uh, under the standards that we operate against. And we have standards which have been for forest management, development, environmental organisation, recreational access sector, as well as the commercial sector and government are, you know, are designed to ensure that we provide 
variety of benefits in all the forests that we plant, not just a you know, commercial output. And uh, part of that is about how we reduce chemical usage. And the chemical usage in the forestry sector is tiny in compared to other land uses. So we, you know, we are bearing down on that. Um, interesting in terms of biodiversity and, and what can be offered, I, I said earlier on that we'd taken, you know, tried to take people out from you know, conservation organisations and others to demonstrate what new forestry looks like and what we're trying to achieve. And one of those was um, in uh, southern Scotland. And uh, Johnny Hughes was part of that group alongside John Muir Trust and others in the RSPB. And we showed them a, a forest which had been created, which retained you know, the high-quality farmland. It had an area for Capra Cayley, uh, you know, to help restore and support that. And we would geared ourselves up for, a, for a three hours of um, you know, intensive interrogation and you know, you know, uh, keeping the spotlight on us and, and having a difficult time. In actual fact, everybody came away from that saying this was just the kind of land use that they wanted to see. And one side we had bare hill land. On the other side, we had a 1970s commercial forest. And we were saying, no, this is what we want in the middle, which is an integrated land use, which is delivering all these benefits. And, I think we need to do more of that, and if we can, then we'll help to deliver those, those planting targets. Sam Gardner, and then Alec Ferguson. Sorry, no, I think I looked in your direction, convener, but I didn't have anything to do. Well, don't be so modest. Um, <laughs> Alec Ferguson. Well, thing to do, convener, is look in your direction at the wrong time. Um, I just wanted to make one point about the... the, the restoration of biodiversity, particularly in Upland and Moorland, Scotland, if I might, um, which is, um, I think, um, I hosted last week, and Jim Hume kindly attended, um, a, a briefing from an initiative called the Understanding Moorland Predation um, Initiative, which we've been talking about holistic uh, ways of approaching things, and this has brought together such diverse um, organisations as the RSPB and the Gamekeepers Federation, who don't always... Uh, meet Gamekeepers Association, sorry, don't always meet eye to eye, but on this occasion do. And I think it would be a good marker to put down when we're talking about um, predation and the impact of forestry on biodiversity, because commercial forestry in particular plays host to a number of predators that, that, that do have an impact on ground nesting birds. I think it would be a good marker to put down that a successor committee might well touch base with that initiative from time to time when looking at biodiversity. Colin Campbell. Add that in relation to the upland biodiversity is a very significant issue that uh, has been recognised in fact in the next five year research programme funded by the Scottish Government sponsored through RESAS. There is a, some significant new experiments being done to look at this issue about upland biodiversity um, because it's, it may be more than one factor. It may not just be all about predators and it may also be about climate change and land management etc. And it's difficult yeah. to tease that out and there, is a, there are new experimentation proposed to, to investigate that in the next five year programme. Uh, these things, I think we're, we're right to say that the, uh, this committee has been on the ball in terms of uh, deer management and it is a big job for the next committee to do but uh, I think we are on the right track but it is a huge uh, matter because we've got to get the deer numbers down to a level that they're in balance with the uh, <coughs> ecosystem and uh, that's a huge job and it's probably going to have to be a compulsory job but uh, the points have been made quite well uh, on that. But we need to move on to sustainable development a bit just now. And Sarah Boyack wanted to uh, kick off on that one because this is the last major part of what we're doing. But it might well include urban matters like air pollution and things like that too. Um, I was thinking of uh, flood management, okay. air pollution. Yep. All right. Let's yep. do that first. Yep. Time the flood management works because it's a, a natural follow-on yep. in some ways from the forestry issue. And okay. I'm just looking at the reforesting the uplands comment from the forestry policy group. Um, we've got the SEPA maps that are in place and the action strategies will be coming out this summer. And I'm thinking that's presumably quite a good issue for the next um, committee to be looking at. I think we've got is it 108,000 households at risk of flooding and the money in place to help 10,000 of them. So we're going to need a, a much more upstream approach and a mix of forestry, flooding, land management, um, agriculture. It's going to be quite a big change there. So I don't know if people have got comments on the different contributions that could be made there. Good, good point. Yep. Anyone else want to make comment? Andy Kerr. Um, okay, so, I mean, I think we all appreciate that adaptation 
in its, in its widest form has been the Cinderella in this space. And, and um, there has been some, some good initiatives. What we are seeing at the moment, obviously, is the, Na uh, is the National Centre for Resilience coming into being, which ought to be a coordination point for going from um, both the end users, from the emergency responders down to the communities and the businesses, um, but also to try and join up much more effectively so that we learn better from what works in one part of the country and can apply it to others. So I think there is, a, there is a sense that we now have a tool that will allow us to do that. I think we have to be very careful about um, going down the line of saying, if only we plant more trees, there will be no flooding downstream. If there's enough rain, it's going to flood. Uh, and the issue then is, how do we best use that land management, which comes back to the, the um, wider land, ref uh, you know, land management understanding of, of the, of, uh, across the country. But we also have two or three um, almost independent parts to what's going on. We've got a climate change risk assessment, which is a statutory duty, which we have to do. We have a Scottish risk assessment coming through, which is focusing on natural hazards as well as other things. So we've actually got lots of different elements which at the moment are not particularly well joined up. And I think the next committee needs to be able to look at how do we draw together those, both on the land um, management, the land planning framework, the uh, Scottish risk assessment, the climate change risk assessment, as well as the SEPA maps. What we do have now, because we've been working quite closely with a number of different partners, is we're finally starting to get some hard data about you know, how many houses are at risk, what are the issues? So we've got a whole set of indicators which allow us to see change as it starts to happen. So we are starting to be able to quantify it rather than to be in this very generic, qualitative, we think there's a problem, we ought to do something about it. So I think we're actually starting to see all the bits come together, but I think that the successor committee could actually start to really pin down who is delivering what in that space to ensure that we have more resilience within both downstream urban communities as well as the upstream um, frameworks. Um, Willie... McGee and then Stuart. Yes, following up on Andy's point, um, trees will not solve your problem. Um, I, I, would, I would concur with that. Um, and I think Colin probably has some opinions. He's nodding. Um, you know, we, we talked about evidence and opinion in the first session. Um, I could get you two hydrologists in this room and one would give you overwhelming evidence that grassland was the best cover and the other would be giving you the trees. Um, I think what, um, uh, from experience, um, certainly, uh, again, in the, in, in the southern uplands, and there's a lady sitting behind here who was involved at an early stage where we were looking at the upper etric and um, floodplain um, mitigation. We know that whilst if enough rain falls, it will flood, um, there are ways of um, making that, um, if you like, gentler and softer if floods can ever be thought of in, in such terms. And that um, um, the landscape, the mosaic of land use that you have, and this comes back into the land use strategy, which is where its home in part should be, um, if you've got a mosaic of land uses and the water is not all being funneled down the Ettrick, Yarrow, Tweed, whatever, um, then um, you, you, you will get buffering. Um, I hesitate to bring up beavers in this conversation, but they are part of biodiversity. Um, so it's gonna, I just throw that one in at the end. But, but in terms of, in terms of Scot Scottish... <laughs> in terms of... In terms of catchment management in the southern uplands, um, 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 Tala and Games Hope um, in, the, in the Moffat Valley, a large-scale native um, afforestation will help buffer the, uh, the water coming down. So, yeah. Andy, yeah. I agree. And one of the challenges, certainly, that we've seen in different parts of Scotland, particularly around the, the central belt, has been when you've got different councils covering different parts, so we're not treating the catchment as a, as a coherent environmental unit, uh, and that has been a big problem. So Alec Ferguson was going to make that point. Uh, if I could just expand on it briefly, yes. you know, I, mean, I absolutely, then, I think this is hugely important that we start looking at whole catchment management when it comes to flood mitigation, and, and recent events in my constituency absolutely bring that home, frankly. Um, Willie, Willie said trees will not solve the flooding, flooding problem. Indeed, they won't. But the management of them and the management of their extraction, I would argue, can have a significant impact 
as I believe it has done in, in one particular area of my constituency, on, on how, how quickly water flows off the hills. Now, I think in terms of, we need to bring all stakeholders together in terms of catchment management. If, if we're, we're not going to stop floods, of course we're not, but I do believe we can mitigate some of their worst impacts. Uh, if we have, a, <laughs> I hate the word holistic too, but we keep coming back to it around this table. If we have a genuinely holistic look at how this could be managed better, I do believe results could be achieved. And not necessarily that expensive either. Uh, Stuart Goodall. I think there's a lot of consensus uh, in the conversation there, and I'm just going to reiterate much of what was said. In fact, you know, we've done a lot of work and, uh, with forest research and others about the, the, the role that forestry can play, you know, slowing the flow so that uh, flood defences aren't overwhelmed. But that's not replacing flood defences. You need hard engineering. But you've also got to design where those, uh, those forests are because what you don't want to do is then have a number of different forests which are all holding back the water at the same time and then releasing it at the same time. So you, there's an awful lot that needs to be looped out. What I would say is that that doesn't mean that it's something you then kick into the long grass, so to speak, for 50 years. It, you can look at this. There are models out there. Um, we've done a lot of work, as I said, with Forest Research who've looked at this in Northern England where you know, they're equally afflicted by, by flooding events. And I think there's a lot of positives that can be taken forward. Uh, so we're very happy to be you know, contributing to that for the future, but it has to be as a, an integrated whole catchment approach. I'm going to try and broaden this out just now into the subject of sustainable development, um, and that can be urban or rural. Uh, I think uh, we've had quite a lot of specifics in the last session there, but um, you know, thinking about fuel poverty, uh, appropriate sustainable work, the kind of services we require, as well as the um, services for the uh, environment, all these things that go together to make what would be sustainable development. What is it that the next committee has to focus on amongst that basket of uh, uh, issues that uh, would help us to actually take Scotland forward? Mike, do you want to? No. Yep. Well, you can prompt them as well, prod them. Yes. Um, I think that is almost impossible. I don't want to disagree with you convenient very much to answer at this particular stage because I don't think the committee is also just as, you know, we were having this discussion earlier on about what committees do and how they operate. The committee is also a creature to some extent of government and time. And I think the, the, the political issues of the election, the issues presented by bodies around this table, the issues that the government, a new government will bring forward will dictate to some extent, to some great extent actually, what the, this, the successor committee chooses to do. There are some core issues that the committee, if, it, if, they're con if the committees are constituted in the same way, cannot ignore. And I think the most important of them is to go back to where we very much started here which is, I think, driving forward the issues of climate change and action about climate change uh, within this parliament. I mean, I think that is the most important responsibility of the committee. Um, and strangely enough, that's probably not been in terms of time that the committee has spent. Uh, probably the bulk of its time has not been spent on that action for a variety of reasons. So I think we have to find a way that that's done. Underneath that comes a range of other issues uh, which need to be actioned. I mean, certainly, laterally, that could be said to be so. In the first half of this I think session, true. Yes. it probably yes. was the other way mm -hmm. round because we had to deal with RPPs and so on uh, and so on. So, Colin, first of all. The point I would like to make is about the, the sustainable development goals. I mean, you know, governments have signed up to these. Um, I think in terms of rural Scotland, we're not necessarily clear exactly how they map onto sort of the livelihoods and businesses in rural Scotland. Um, I think there, there's sort of two things that are different about the sustainable development goals that we didn't have before, and that is about involving the private sector much more in the development sustainable development goals, and that's going to have a particular flavour for rural Scotland, I think. Um, and I think the, the other thing is there's a greater emphasis on what they call, I think they call small stakeholders, which we can take to, for rural businesses as small, small businesses or small farm units. And, uh, you know, there's a great deal more thinking going on that, behind that that could actually look at in relation to rural Scotland, but how we map onto those uh, international sustainable development goals. It's a big opportunity to coordinate because none of these things are, happen in isolation just in Scotland. They, they scale up across Europe and across the world. So I think there's thinking about how they, they map onto rural Scotland is an important thought exercise. Can I, can I just say in terms of sustainability, and I entirely agree with Colin, those are crucial issues. 
survival is actually an issue in many parts of rural Scotland. For example, in the areas that I represent, sustainability, we all understand, or think we understand what words mean, depopulation, an ageing an aging population, lack of economic opportunities, um, increasing cost, uh, problems with local government, those become issues of survival in rural Scotland, and the committee will need to be in a position to try and address those. Th that's not to say that these high-level, and they are high-level discussions, are not vital, but at, 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 at very much at grass and islands root level, there are some really crucial issues that have to be decided about how you sustain and make rural communities survive. Yep. Uh, Sam Gardner, first. Thank you, convener. Um, I just wanted to build on what Mr. Russell was saying around the focus on the Climate Change Act, and I think it's, convener, you were right to reflect on the fact that at the beginning there was an awful lot of focus around RPP2 and its development. I think the challenge, and trying to bring this back to the implementation or the achievement of sustainable development, is uh, the committee having the capacity within all the other demands that incur on it to take a view of the implementation of that document and proactively engage with its uh, strengths and weaknesses, the areas where it's seen to be struggling. Um, and I've been, ab been able to identify specific sectors where there is significant opportunity to further sustainable development goals, such as in urban air quality and transport, particularly where obviously our emissions are languishing at about what they were in 1990. So there's a clear climate change agenda, but there's also public health agenda, uh, social um, impacts. And similarly in the housing sector, where fuel poverty is still way too high, over 40%. So I think, but the, I, the committee has um, a challenge in terms of data provision, um, the access to live data. I think RPP2 has been too much of a static document which hasn't allowed for uh, adaption, reflection and change. Um, so I, what I would hope in the, in the future is that the, the future committee uh, engages with the, the new governance structures of the uh, the, the government have put in place, the Cabinet Subcommittee, um, requests and tries to put that onus on the government to provide live data as to the effectiveness of different policies because its greatest contribution is this committee or its future one with a focus on uh, climate change will be ensuring that, that everything is being done to deliver on that Climate Change Act. That will be the biggest single uh, contribution it can make to ensuring that we fulfil our sustainable development goals. Okay. Uh, Claudia, yes. Just a very brief point following on from what um, Mike Russell said, that um, in my view, and maybe I'm missing the point, but surely part of the legacy for this committee, if it remains a rural affairs committee, should be exactly looking at the sustainable development goals and seeing how, how those underpin and, and indeed are overarching for all the issues that we should be dealing with. Um, and that sort of goes back to Colin Campbell's point. And I, I think looking at those and seeing how they can help our fragile communities and our biodiversity and, and how it all fits together and fuses into one positive future for rural Scotland might well be helpful. That's just a comment. Well, the, the uh, UN development goals and forestry and woodlands. Uh, Willie and then Stuart for nearly the last words. I would like to agree with Mike. I think sustainable development as a phrase is both enormous, intimidating, difficult to get to grips with and I would caution against trying to deal with it um, as a single issue within a committee. Um, I think it's one of those things that's probably cross-cutting because it's got economy, because it's got social, because it's got environment that they, the, whatever committee comes next would want to be very careful about how, how it understood what view it took on the meaning of sustainable development and which bits of it that, it that it tackled. And it could play a role in, somebody mentioned baselining in the first session or benchmarking, um, looking at where you were with fuel, Sam's talked about fuel poverty, specific issues. Um, and uh, it may be that it, the, the role that the committee played was in a, that prodding role that you alluded to, um, Rob, earlier on, um, of other committees that had uh, some of the social and the economy elements under their um, power, if you like. Okay, uh, Stuart Goodall and uh, Ian Gulland. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up <coughs> very specifically on uh, the point that Mike Russell made about uh, you know, how do sustainable development was a look like a local, you know, an area in a community scale. Uh, I mean, it's something that we found very interesting. We've been looking at over the last year, and I had a an excellent visit to the Northwest Mall Community Woodland, where 
you have a group there that's taken over a 1960s commercial forest and it's now up there to be, to be harvested and they're maintaining the heart of that commercial component so it's going to continue to produce income. But having that resource, they're able to deliver uh, new housing, increase numbers of jobs. Uh, what we're seeing is wood fuel to support um, and tackle fuel poverty. Uh, so there's a community there who are benefiting hugely from that asset. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we would be very keen to look at. How can we recreate, and Willie was saying, how can we create more of these? I think there are real opportunities to look at these as practical examples of, of local community-based sustainable development. <coughs> Uh, yeah. uh, it's really just going back to the idea of the circular economy, which we talked about earlier, <clears throat> which is obviously very exciting for Scotland, but I think there are huge opportunities to do that across the whole of Scotland, not just consider that the opportunities in the central belt, uh, you know, the, the work that we've done to identify those opportunities, particularly in some of the key sectors, the agricultural sector, the, the beer and f uh, fish farming, and the whisky industry are across Scotland, uh, and I think that's really possibly something that the committee should, the future committee should bear in mind as, as we move towards this idea of a circular economy in Scotland. Is how do we make sure that we get those jobs and economic opportunities in the rural parts of Scotland? Because they are there. Uh, this is not about sucking all of the materials out of Scotland into the central belt to, 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 to reap benefit. This is about real opportunity for jobs. You know, work that's carried on at both Scottish level, UK level. You know sees opportunities upwards of, of 17, 18,000 jobs. These are in communities up and down the breadth of Scotland, including repair, you know, people you know, fixing shoes uh, all over Scotland, not sending them away to some factory or, or processing in, in the central belt. That's what this is about. This is what the opportunity is. Uh, and so I think what I'm listening to is the same challenges in agriculture and, and forestry and how do we engage communities and get them to understand that there are real benefits in, in doing things differently. And it's the same for me in the, the circular economy. And I think that shouldn't be forgotten about going forward. I think that's a very good way in which perhaps to wind this up just now. Um, <coughs> I, like Mike Russell, represent uh, areas with some of the most endangered species. And the most endangered species of all are human beings in very fragile communities who do feel responsible for their environment, who do feel that they've got a capacity to do much better and to make sure that there's a place for the young people to grow uh, and so on, and that they will provide services for bigger communities in due course. But uh, that sustainable development goal at the world level and the sustainable development goal that we see in this committee does reflect right down to the most local areas, such as the north coast of Sutherland that uh, I was visiting once again last Friday. So thank you very much for all of these AIDS memoir, because the next committee will have an exciting chance to take these forward. It's been a pleasure in uh, receiving your evidence uh, in my role as the convener of this which I will no longer have after the 23rd of March. So thank you very much, all of you. We have to move on to some other business. So we'll have to suspend just now, but we can't have long conversations uh, in the room. It is in public. It's about uh, some secondary legislation. Thank you all very much.
Hello, everybody. We're just going to finish off the business. It is in public, but uh, um, it is uh, the business of agenda item two, subordinate legislation, and this item includes uh, four pieces, one, two, three, five pieces of uh, secondary legislation. Uh, and I'm aware that Dave Thompson's not back yet, so I don't want to make that mistake because he may wish to comment on at least one of them. Um, but I'll read them out as I have to do. The Seed Licensing and Enforcement etc. Scotland Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-68. Uh, the Seed Fees Scotland Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-69. The Plant Health Scotland Amendment Order 2016 SSI 2016 uh, uh, The Wester Ross Marine Conservation Order 2016 SSI 2016 88. And uh, the Loch Sunert to Sound of Jura Marine Conservation Order 2016 SSI 2016 90. I refer members to the paper. And I'll take them in turn. Uh, does anyone have any comments on the seed licensing enforcement? Uh, on the seed fees? On the plant health? On the Wester Ross Marine Conservation Order? Plant health. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, it's actually a matter of process rather than content. I did attempt to read it. And page 23... To 24, I would ask the authors of such reports to really consider how they're presented. It's one of the most difficult things I've had to read. It's one paragraph that goes over for more than a page. It's just almost impossible to read. That matter is now a matter of record. And we'll thank you tell for them. There. Indeed, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> any more on the plant health on Westeros uh, Marine Conservation Area? Dave Thompson, very briefly. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, it's really just a, a, a point to note. I think it may be an error in the policy note and the business and regulatory impact assessment. On page 44 of the committee papers, it refers to the type of um, trawling and so on that can be carried out within the Western Ross Marine Conservation uh, Area. And it mentions uh, vessels of under 150 gross tonnage in that note. Now, the actual order itself it, um, prohibited and regulated activities, uh, paragraph 4, refers to the engine power not exceeding 500 kilowatts, which is a, a better way to deal with these matters. So it was just to point out that there appears to be a contradiction there that the, the 150 tons are still being mentioned in the note, whereas the order itself deals with engine size. And that can be quite a crucial difference. It can indeed. So we will point that out to the government. But I think probably it's correct to say that the order itself is in order. Yes. Claudia Bimish. Thank you, Kavina. It was simply to highlight in relation to the Westeros um, MPA. Uh, uh, along with um, the points that have been made on other MPAs, how important the continuing science and socio-economic um, research in the future um, uh, will be in terms of making sure that these have been got right for both the protection of habitats and their recovery, but also for our fragile communities. Based, of course, on evidence, as <laughs> we know. Convener. It's essential that we have the information and the research to do so. Uh, thank you. I very much welcome uh, the Westeros Marine Conservation Order, uh, and I believe it's going to work very well and that there will be integration between the different sectors, and we'll have to see that they are reviewed, of course, so that we make sure that there isn't unintended consequences. Uh, the Loch Sunert to Sound of Jura Marine Conservation Order. Mike Russell. I want to put on record two points, the first of which is this is the final um, order affecting uh, my constituency, MPA affecting my constituency at this stage. And whilst I think everybody welcomes them, the process as adopted by Marine Scotland and putting them together in my constituency was not acceptable. And people, people, people found it unacceptable because they understood things were happening or being done which didn't happen. That must be avoided. And in the future, 
I would hope that the process of making changes uh, to designations or creating new designations is a collaborative and participatory process for all those involved, and particularly those who are making their living in the area, rather than an imposition. And if that can be achieved, and that's the right way to achieve it, then I think that uh, what we've gone through might have been a useful learning experience, very painful if it was. If it can't be achieved, then we will simply see the type of thing we've been through repeated again and again. Thank you very much for that. So um, we've made comments as we wish, and uh, I thank members for that. So if the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Agreed. No, we are agreed. Thank you. So, future meeting details. At our next meeting of the committee, we'll consider several items of subledge and uh, petitions on wild goose numbers and conserving wild salmon. Uh, we will also consider drafts of our annual report and legacy report. Uh, I now close the meeting. Thank you, everybody, for your particip participation. <laughs>